see how this works. Just want to see if that works. All righty. We're here, folks, for the uh, September 10th, 2019, 1 p.m. docket, or thereabouts, of the uh, BMZA. Uh, just have a couple preliminary uh, announcements, uh, rules, protocol, that sort of thing. Ask to please turn off all your cell phones. Uh, keep the talking to a minimum. Of course, if you have to have a conversation that might be fruitful to your matter, uh, you can feel free to step outside and, and continue that discussion. Uh, but as you probably all know, the proceedings are recorded uh, here with these microphones and also uh, by video, uh, so we don't want those proceedings interrupted. Uh, the board will vote on each case and make a decision at the end of the docket. Uh, as always, we offer the opportunity for you to hear a, a civics lesson and to stay to hear that uh, decision. Otherwise, you can call the BMZA office tomorrow morning after 9 a.m. The number is 410-396-4301. Again, 410-396-4301. Uh, failing that, you should receive a resolution in the mail within 30 days. Uh, and as always, we ask that you please do not do any work until your matter, or your resolution is received. And of course, don't do any work or building in Baltimore City uh, without pulling the proper permits. Uh, we have a number of cases, as you all know, with opposition. Uh, I think we've dealt preliminarily, pre preliminarily with some of those um, and administratively. I, I guess uh, case number 2019-165 and 2019-179, uh, we've discussed various time limits and the order in which uh, those cases will proceed on the docket. Uh, so that's that. Uh, going to our regular cases, I don't know if I need to mention this, but I will since we have a, a, a full room. Um, aside from those larger cases in which we know you've had discussions with regard to your opposition, if there are any other cases in which there's opposition and you have not spoken, the parties have not spoken, uh, we'd like to encourage that discussion uh, in the event that it might prove fruitful. Um, is there anyone who would like the opportunity to discuss the matter with their opposing side, but has not yet had an opportunity to do so? Sir, could you stand up and tell me the case ma case for which you're here? I believe the young lady told me it was 268, the one for 3600 Hudson Street. Uh, 3600 Hudson Street. And the applicant for uh, Hudson Street, John Lipper Lipperini. Okay. Uh, looks like there's someone who might want to discuss this matter with you, sir. Uh, if you'd like to, you may feel free to do so outside, and uh, perhaps you can come to a resolution. Thank you. Anyone else who would like the opportunity to have a uh, conversation uh, with the other side? All right. <coughs> I'm going to then, we don't have any postponements, right? Okay, so now we'll go to the consent docket. Uh, consent cases are those cases for which the board uh, believes it has sufficient information uh, to grant the request. Uh, when I call the case number, please line up to my left. Uh, and then we'll call the case, get the staff reports, and then hear anything else you'd like to uh, present with regard to that matter. And those cases are as follows. Case number 2019-272, 1313 West 42nd Street, Mitch Maltese. <clears throat> Case number 2019-280, 3405 Foster Avenue, Matt, and I'm not going to destroy that last name, Knopfel, close enough, <laughs> all right. Uh, Following that case, 2019-281, 601 South Robinson Street. Again, Mr. Knopfel. Uh, we also have case number 2019-287, 729 South Conkling Street, Steve Carroll. And finally, we have 2019-288, 2700 Chesswold Road, and that's on behalf of Richardson Engineering, LLC. You got taken off. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, call the first case, uh, 219 or 2019 272. 
Uh, the address is 1313 West 42nd Street. Uh, Mr. Mitch Maltese. Uh, and this is a request to construct a one-story rear addition. Is that correct? That's correct. Do we have any staff report? Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Maltese, is there anything that you'd like to add to your application? No, sir. Okay. Well, uh, the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to grant your appeal. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, board. Uh, next case, 2019-280, 3405 Foster Avenue. Uh, Matt Nufflin. Good afternoon. Please tell me your name. Nuffle. Nuffle. Yes. Yeah. Apologize. <laughs> he knew it. Yes. All right, and uh, Mr. Nuffle, this is uh, a request to construct a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck. Is that correct? Okay, do we have any staff reports for 2019-280? Yes, we have a letter of support uh, in the file from the Canton Community Association. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nuffle, is there anything else you'd like to add to this application? No, sir. All right. Well, the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Again, that's 3405 Foster Avenue. Now we'll call case of 2019-281, 601 South Robinson Street. Again, Mr. Nuffle, this is uh, also to construct a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Do we have any staff reports for this matter? Yes, we have a letter for this one as well as for support from the Canton Community Association. Planning Department has reviewed this application and has no comment. Thank you. Very well. Uh, Mr. Nuffle, is there anything else you'd like to add to this application? No, sir. All right, very well. Again, the board having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good Take care. Uh, Calling the case of 2019-287, 729 South Conkling Street. Mr. Steve Carroll. Yes, sir. And, sir, this is a request to construct a two-story rear addition that will include a rear-loading garage and rooftop deck. Is that right. correct? All right. Do we have any staff reports for 2019-287? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Mr. Carroll, is there anything you'd like to add to your application? No, sir. All right. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, finally, case number 2019-288. 2700 Chesswold Road, uh, and we have Richardson Engineering, LLC, represented by... Rick Richardson. Okay, Mr. Richardson, thanks for coming. Uh, this is a request to construct a one-story side addition, is that correct? Correct. Do we have any staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Richardson, is there anything you'd like to add to this application? No, sir. Very well. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Back to the regular docket. Uh, when I call the case, the applicant should stand to my left and the opposition uh, to my right. Uh, the applicant will have an opportunity to present, and then the opposition, and then, just like in court, the applicant will have the final word. Uh, we do not wish to continue the back and forth beyond applicant, opposition, and then applicant. Uh, so we'll call the cases. Case first case is 2018 452. 1743 North Washington Street. J.R. Woolman, LLC. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, sir. Before we have you all sworn, uh, Mr. Woolman, this is a request to use the first floor as a grocery store. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And if we could have the witnesses sworn. Uh, raise your right hands, please. Raise your right hand, please. Do you raise your right hand, sir? Would you like to testify? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, do we have any staff reports? Yes, thank you. Planning Department has reviewed this application, noted that it is essentially identical to a previous application which was disapproved by the Board on October 30th of 2017 for a retail goods establishment with no alcoholic beverage sales. The Department recommends that approval of this application, if granted, be subject to the condition that all exterior alterations, additions, and signage are completed in accordance with the provisions of the Broadway East Urban Renewal Plan, which covers the area where this property is located. Thank you. Mr. Woolman, having heard those conditions from planning, uh, if the board were to favorably 
be disposed towards your application, are those conditions acceptable to your client? They, they are acceptable, Mr. Chair. I do have a preliminary matter, however, I'd like to bring to the board's attention. Yes, sir. Um, I, I'd spoken to the one individual to my, directly to my left outside as she had signed in. I did not see the other individual signed in. You had a chance to speak with her. We did speak on the phone last week, but then I got a text last night, which was very different from our conversation last week, and we haven't had a chance to speak today. So I'd like the opportunity to speak with her um, regarding the change in position, et cetera. Uh, and after that, I may or may not desire to proceed at that time. That would be fine. Um, <laughs> we can defer this matter, give you an opportunity to continue your discussions. Thank you very much. All appreciate right, we'll that. We'll move on to the next matter. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Trouble switching from track to track, so just give me a second each time. Very well. Uh, calling the case of 2019-246, 921 Crescent Street. Kristen Trujillo. Case number 2019-246, 921 Crescent Street. Kristen Trujillo. I'm sorry, did you say 240? No, 920, case number is 2019-246. Property address is 921 Crescent. Mr. Trujillo, to construct a one-story rear addition. No show. Mm -hmm. Move on to the next matter, case number 2019-260, 1725 Alisana Street, Adam Carballo, to construct the deck in the rear. I know he's here. Okay. Mr. Carballo, possibly outside. Just walking in now, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Gamalo. Uh, we're here for 2019-260, 1725 Alisana Street. And this is a request to construct a deck in the rear. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, do we have any opposition here? Um, I do. I am. All right. Can you swear the parties? I swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Okay. Uh, do we have any staff reports? Yes, planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property, according to the record available to the planning department, which is basically the city plat map and other related information, shows this property is measuring approximately 18 feet 6 inches by 48 feet deep. The plan presented in the application shows a property which is 62 feet deep. The discrepancy appears to relate to this item, which I'd like to read in full. Baltimore City records, including the block plat map for this property, show a two foot six inch wide alley bordering the east side of this property and terminating at the rear lot line of this property and a lot dimension of 16 feet by 48 feet. The applicant's proposed site plan describes the property as having a lot area equal to 18 feet, six inches wide by 62 feet deep and shows the existing deck built on what may be part of the rear portion of the adjoining property known as 1723 Alisana Street. There is no documentation of the ownership of this portion of the lot block 1845, lot 11, or of the adjoining alley described above included with this application. Given that the last notation of changes to the plat map were recorded on that map in 1997, one year after the applicant states the construction of the deck occurred here, the applicant would need to show that this deck is not an encroachment on a neighboring property before the board can consider this application. This property is also located in the Fells Point Historic District and the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area, and there obviously would have to be an authorization to proceed from the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation and an approval uh, from the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Commission representative for what is proposed. The department is therefore recommending deferral of a complete hearing of this application to allow the applicant time to assemble documentation of ownership of the land beneath the, his, the existing deck and to file an application for an authorization to proceed with the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Gabarlo, um, having heard uh, the information from planning, uh, one, let me just ask, do you have any knowledge of the status of the property ownership 
I do. Um, there was actually a resubdivision back in 2003. Um, we submitted documentation of that effect. Okay, um, is that, has that been presented in the file, if we know? You have it in your packet. Okay, got it. Thank and you. the property, and I also have uh, some site plans that are brought today that show before and after subdivision, which reconciles the true, or the current uh, size of the lot. Um, and this is actually a Baltimore City block, block plat. Uh, as you can see off on this lower uh, left-hand corner has the updated uh, plat, okay. uh, which, which shows the re-subdivision as it currently stands. And that was presented to, uh, I emailed to Mr. Barb um, the other day. Okay. That should be in your, I in find your file. In this um, I also have uh, some other documentation Thank you. Packet. I'm sorry you were saying, Mr. Corvallo? Uh, I also have some additional documentation that's dated July 23rd, 2003, um, you know, from the planning department that uh, that should also be in your packet as well. Okay. Yes, July 23rd, 2003, uh, to Mr. Joseph Larson, President, Spellman Larson Associates. Yes, sir. And what is that effectively stating? It's basically stating that the, the property was resubdivided. Um, the former property had a um, sort of an L-shaped lot. Um, my my our subject property is the one that is darkened and hatched. Uh, had sort of a it was shorter. Um, they were resubdivided, so there were two sort of rectangular-shaped lots. So the the deck in question is actually on his property uh, as of 2003. Um, there was a smaller deck that was then extended after after it was resubdivided. Um, All right. Well, tell us about the, the project. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Levy uh, is, is standing to my right. He is the property owner. Um, he had a, a effectively a balcony at the re at the rear of the uh, of the rear of the property um, that he built in approximately 1998. Um, he did not build it with permits. Um, and then when he resubdivided the property approximately 16 years ago, he extended the deck um, to the, to the adjoining, uh, all the way to the rear lot, which came in physical, uh, that, that came to the property line of 705 uh, South Register Street. Um, he has recently uh, cut back the deck by by 18 inches, uh, it no longer physically touches 705 East Register Street. Has some photographs that kind of show the current state of that. This is taken from the other day, um, and um, we're here today. Uh, this is a, a we're here today to sort of request a variance for the seven yard rear yard setback for a deck. Um, we are able to provide 18 inches, which is the current state, of, well, current condition of the setback. Um, you know, in lieu of the seven feet. Um, so this uh, Mr. this deck previously went all the way to the wall. It previously went all the way to the wall, and um, the the neighbor, Miss Tempora, who's standing to my left, um, is taking issue with the deck coming into conflict with her wall. Um, as a compromise, he has cut it back by 18 inches, so it no longer physically touches her property. Um, and you know, this has been you know sort of we we documented through the photographs. Um, the deck itself has a drainage system. It has a solid surface on it. It's, it's not open decking. He has like a sort of a rubber membrane of some kind. And there is a, a gutter system that he's added uh, with that deck to uh, bring water uh, through his sally port. So the, the original deck construction in 98 was done without a permit, correct? Correct. The extension, you'd said 13, 14 years ago? Uh, 2003. Okay. Yeah. Um, was there a permit? Um, obtained for that? There was not, no. Or was there a permit obtained from the cutting of uh, the two no, feet? That, no, not at all. No, okay. I mean, it, n nothing was done with permits. Okay. It, it's, it's sir, fine. sir, I just hired the, the guy, you know. Excuse me, I need your uh, name, sir. Oh, I'm so sorry. I need, yeah, you're oh. on the record now, you, I need uh, your name. Arthur Dean Levy, and I'm the owner of the property. We're going to have to, you have to spell it. First A -R -K -A -E -Y -L -E -B -I. name? A-R-K-A-E-Y L-E-B-I. 
Uh, I hired the company, I don't remember who it was. And, um, in 1998. Well, in, in 1998, it's just, hey, build me a deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As a homeowner, you don't know all the peculiarities. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will also mention that, you know, he, uh, Fells Point, um, the, the, the CHAP district, I believe, was enacted in 2007. Yeah. So this is prior to, I mean, that doesn't excuse the fact that we should have gotten a permit, um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was done prior to the district being enacted as a CHAP district, which I believe was 2007. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to add to your presentation? At the time when I put, uh, when the deck was built, uh, Mrs. Campora was not an owner of the property in question, and it was never a subject um, of this deck being built the way it was built uh, with the previous owner of the property. Okay. In fact, that was not even a subject until just recently. The company that built the deck in the 90s, was that the same company that modified it in, t- in 2003? No. Yes. So you had two in the 90s, originally when I purchased the, uh, this house in 1996, there was a small, like a balcony. Mm-hmm. And then when I purchased the house next door, because at one point I had both houses in my possession, and that's when we decided to go and start building the deck and uh, started also subdividing. So no, it was a different company. Different company. But I had no way of knowing. I mean, it's just. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Cabal? Um, I, I, I believe that's it. Thank you. Um, Pam, we'll hear from you now. Am I allowed to ask questions now or afterwards? Oh, you have to speak to us and then we can ask the questions. questions. <laughs> okay. So introduce myself and yes, my standing. Okay. My name is Deborah Tempera and I am the owner of 705 South Register Street. Um, I'm also the owner of 1721 Alizana Street. Um, This particular parcel is landlocked. You cannot see anything in the rear unless you get a bird's eye view. Um, I do have a little bit pairing with the variance. I mean, one of the things the variance requires that there's clarity on this. So I can submit this. It gives you a little bit more precedence to sh- show my wall and what was how it was done. Okay, tell us what we're looking at in this photograph. Um, the deck is. Yeah, there we have. Um, this is the deck. The small balcony, like he said, was built. That balcony actually was built by a friend of mine by the name of Tim Filker. Um, the extension of the deck, I believe, because I knew they were rebuilding, was built by his brother, his ex brother-in-law. Um, um, they were there doing the construction on the deck, and Arkady was also building the deck. But that's, it to me, is not a very important portion. We're talking about variants here. This is my wall. The yellow one is my wall. So the length of the deck, its full lot coverage, basically, was um, obtained. And this is, of course, before they cut portion of the deck. Right? Yes, they cut that back on um, June the 25th, a Tuesday, with um, – uh, the building inspector was there the day before. Um, Arkady had cut it back on either it was a Tuesday or Wednesday. I noticed in the deck, and they were there back there cutting the deck. Um, I had called the building inspection. They should have stopped, put a stop work order, but at that point they didn't. Um, my concerns were there are a lot of concerns. Uh, who, you know, it should, you know, how do I still have clearance? Um, the drainage of this deck was not good when it was built. Um, all the water flowed to the, the wall, and I didn't realize that all those years because, one, um, I didn't see it, but then when I came back from Europe this year in September, I went into my basement, and my walls also, it explained, because where the deck is, this basically is my stairway. Um, mm-hmm. going up to my steps and I do have photographs of moisture readings that I've been taking since May so the water was definitely traveling down I have photographs of water I was up in the rain a lot of times between May and June taking things because I you know I don't I don't want to accuse somebody I need to find the answer but this building has been taking a beating and I could not figure out why I thought it was the grade level issue because their grading of their yard also runs all towards this wall but we're here you for variance excuse me you live in 1721 um, no I do not so you rent um, yes well I it's my 
guest house, basically. <laughs> because I live in a small condo. But How long house. have you owned the property? Ten years come August. So the prior owner didn't know anything about it because Joe was a reclusive. Um, he wouldn't have known. He wasn't going to, he was a cripple a little bit. He wouldn't have gotten on his roof and saw what was going on. The building was in bad shape as far as the plaster on the inside wall and this brick. In fact, they allowed me, Arkady and Nina, the owner of 1723, to repoint the wall of which I did. I asked the question and questioned. I did see that the deck was to the property line, but I... Was the the deck was to the property line when you purchased it, though, right? Um, yeah, but I didn't see it until I got on it two or three years after to repair the brick. Okay. And at that time, too, I had no knowledge that the deck, the water flow, was running against the wall. Even though Nina showed me, before he put the gutter system on, which was just like two years, the water would just run off the side of it. I mean, I have videotapes of the water, and I do have some photographs. If this interests you, are we on the variance, or are we on... You want I'm interested in anything you'd like to make a record of. So oh, okay. Photos. All right. Well, let me get off. Okay. Um, okay. So we have our photograph of the way um, the deck was before you cut it back just this recently. This plan might be helpful, too. This is before, sure. before and after subdivision. These are photos I would like to put into the record of when he cut it back. Okay. Do you have a copy for me? Uh, I just gave it my last one. This is just that's a site plan. I'm sorry again. These are photos uh, of the deck cut back. The deck's been cut back. We don't know if it. Um, I don't think this meets up to code or it, how if it has drainage. None of that's been testing. The architect didn't even realize that the deck had a membrane. So technically, it's not even a deck. It's either a balcony or a porch because it has a rubber roof. Um, maybe not a porch, but a balcony. Um, there's a rubber membrane underneath of it, and it collects a lot of water, and all that concentration, unfortunately, goes towards the back of the wall. What are, <coughs> what are we looking at here in this photo? Um, the deck cut pack. The That's a side view. I, I couldn't get access any other way. So if you're standing on the east side of the side of his building, that's how far he cut the deck back. So we're here for the variance of an inch and seven inches. The only reason why I figured he chose that is because he has a support and beam underneath and he has no intention on reconstruction of the deck. And this is basically... that way what are we wh what is this right here that is a piece of metal flashing that was against the wall and what's the purpose of metal flashing then? well when we redid the pointing of the brick the water was running behind the his um, end of the deck boards so the, um, the it was just running down the wall so they said, well, if you put a flashing here, it, it can't run behind it. So, but what was happening, it was compounding and running underneath of it through the rubber membrane, of which I don't have any photographs of that, right? I mean, I have it on my phone, but not, and a video, but not that. Is your house shown here? Uh, the wall is. is like which, which one? Oh, uh, on the like left this side. one? That's my wall, yes. Here? Yes. There are a series of pictures in this handful that were just handed to me, uh, different ones. Yeah, they're basically, because you're get, we're getting into the, some moisture stuff, just to show the reading. The deck, um, this one here is basically, the moisture reading is the deck board of that thing was basically right at that height of the stairwell inside my house. All right, hold on. You've handed me these, I'm going to ask you what they are. This is demonstrating the water collection how on, the, on the deck. Well, how it flows to the back of the wall and then goes and catches into the membrane. And yeah, okay. it's just the picture that is. Usually, I think a building code is all water, wherever it is, is supposed to be running away from a wall, not towards a wall. This is water readings? Yes. Okay. This is 
the blow up of water? Yes. What are, they, what are they, what they uh, With your glasses, you can see them. It says 100. Um, I mean, I, I can see them online. Oh, yeah. I'm asking you to tell oh, 100% moisture, 70% moisture, 50% moisture. With a six hundred dollar moisture reader, okay. like how do you use it? Um, you um, you put it against the wall and it'll change. You'll see some of them are only ten or twelve. As you go up, it gets a little less. Or if you go over to the side, so you can see where the water concentration is. is. There, like damage on the wall, like is there? Um, this wall was damaged. I repaired it. It is now starting to get a little bit of. When you tap onto the plaster, you can feel that movement a little bit, but no hole there. The downstairs bathroom, the little bathroom underneath of it, one of the pictures is of the bathroom with the moisture readings. That this is the end. This is that this is the way it was before he cut it back. Okay, so let me ask you: Have you taken any moisture readings since the cut? Yes. And are those included in these photographs? Um, they are. Well, they was. I think the date on there. Yes. There may be. This looks like a May date to me. Um, no, there's a 625 on there. 625 was 100, and six. In the building in the gym? No, that's just the reflection of the piece of metal. Th there is a 18-inch gap there. Right. Now, now it is. Okay. He cut it back. Um, that's been since June of this year. Yes, he cut it back June 25th. Okay. Since he cut it back, how is water now affecting the building? I mean, it um, sounds like you may you may have a civil action. Know. Well, but that's why I wasn't getting into this. I wasn't getting into various. My main point is, is that when you look at, if you look about variance codes, um, I don't think he meets the variance codes. In 5-308, um, I want to address number four and number seven. And it'd be in the, the, the number four says the variance will not be in Injurious. Injurious to the use and employment of other property in the immediate vicinity, substantially diminish and impair property value in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Is your allegation that it's still, even though it's been cut back and no longer touching your house? It's over a hundred years old, and these bricks need. When the oh, I'm when sorry. The was talking, you have to wait till they're finished. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 go ahead. So I want you to specifically ask this question because I can tell where you were going that maybe you weren't going to ask. The question is: Is it your allegation that as it's cut back? It's still dumping water on your property. No, that's not my allegation right now. My allegation is basically maintenance of the property. I should be able to have access. That's why we have sometimes building codes. Um, I a variance. Uh, the this makes it very difficult to maintain this wall. When was the wall repaired that you indicated a repair? That particular part, he would he doesn't talk to me, Mr. Harkaday. In fact, we went out for negotiation, and there was no negotiation. It was basically running me into why aren't you accepting this one foot seven inch cutback my question is mm -hmm. you mentioned that the wall was repaired your wall was repaired oh the whole wall except where his boards hit against the building okay so now that the boards do not hit against the building is first of all because you couldn't repair that portion did it need repair where the boards hit the building where the boards hit your wall it needed not to have water banging against it because even fresh mortar will suck in water. Okay, so now it no longer has, since June, has not had water hitting against it, right? Well, yeah, the water runs off the deck and now into the ground that is uh, not with this part, but a grating that hits against the wall. So, the issue, so my question again goes to the portion that you couldn't get access to of the wall when the board went all the way up against it. The board's not all the way up against it now. Have you assessed the wall to see if there's any damage to that portion, and uh, are you able to repair that? I, so. I couldn't get a close-up, but there's definitely damage to the area, because prior to that even, there's a bunch of bricks that are higher than the deck and lower than the deck that had popped recently, maybe over the last year or two. Arcady just informed oh. me last year. So some of the bricks need to be oh, replaced. Right. They popped at the 15. So, but it's not easy to go between one foot seven inches. You either have to find the very skinny person or always have to worry about who the property owner is to allow you to be standing on a deck when it didn't have a very, it's, it, it wasn't built correctly in the first place and it needed a variance. How much space would you need between the wall and the deck 
to perform regular maintenance on your wall? If you do some readings, you'll see that the average scaffolding is between three and four uh, feet wide because if I am not allowed onto the property and I have to do airspace, it, you're talking about you need at least four feet. Because, you know, no one wants to stand on a two-foot scaffolding or any kind of plank. It's a safety code. Mr. Carvalho, how uh, deep is the deck from the rear of the structure right now um, as we speak today? It is 14 foot six. If it was scaled back another two feet to 12 feet and some inches, is that something that could be done? Uh, physically, it could be done. Um, I would also add that we're only talking about something that's about eight and a half feet off the ground that could easily reach with a ladder. Um, I also have photographs of the Again, color photographs of the of the brick wall, um, you know, where you can kind of see the ghost of where the old ledger board used to be, um, where you can kind of see that, you know, what the condition of the brick is. Uh, you could easily reach that with a ladder. It, it wouldn't require a four foot wide scaffolding um, to gain access to that. When were these photos taken, Mr. Carballo? Uh, yesterday. Yes. Did you discern any damage to the wall if you looked at the wall? Um, photos were taken? It, it probably should be repointed. Uh, but I, I didn't, I, it probably should be repointed in that area where the ledger board was removed. But I didn't see any great damage. I mean, it looked pretty typical of 100 year old brick. And then let me just ask you have you had anyone attempt to look at the wall and assess its condition since June 2019, since the, it was cut back? Well, it's not, like I said, very easy. We did try. Okay. That. The question is, have you had anyone try to do it? They said for safety purposes. It's time for a, oh, it's yes. a yes or no question. Oh, yes. Have yes. you asked anyone to come out and look at it? Yes, yes or no? Okay. What did they tell you? Did they, first of all, did they do it? Excuse me? Did they go look at it? Uh, yes. Yeah. One, um, yeah. Mr. Miles Poland. <laughs> Okay, well, it's just very difficult to get. I understand I know. the difficulty, ma'am. What, I, what I'm like, what I want to hear well, is what you found in, in terms of condition today. To be able to set up scaffolding, you need at least three yeah, feet. Heard that. We're asking well, I said four, but three feet. Sorry, sorry I couldn't hear what um, the commissioner said. I'm sorry. No, the, we're, we're making a record here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand ideal maybe four feet, three feet may be enough. Whatever the amount of space is, did anybody look at it? Did they assess it? What did they find? Today, I want to know. Well, Do you know that? No. Okay. And because the owner of the property won't let me on his property. <laughs> but I've not asked him because he... <sighs> Wait a minute. The owner of the property won't let you on his property, but you've not asked him to do what? Get on the property? Well, I asked to negotiate, and he won't talk to me. Well, that's a different question. Then can I get on your property to take a look at my wall? Well, my lawyer is in the process of doing that, yeah. But All right. I am know that it's in need of the wall. So the fact of the variance, though, I don't think he meets the criteria of a variance. Okay. And it's not easy to get between. I, wor I c did several buildings. I'm not naive to construction. And I, I, also understand, I understand the difficulty with which, which you speak. I, I, we have that down. I'm just trying to establish factually what the condition of the wall is since an adjustment was made and the question that was posed. Oh, by Mr. Well, Bond. the moisture, I did do the moisture reading things, and the fact is it says that I was told that moisture in the walls take, can take up to several weeks to a month or more to dry out. So right now, we have not, it's very difficult to tell if it's a continuation of process due to the fact that it's cut back or if it's the fact that it's um, so much in those bricks that. May or whenever the cut before the cutback was. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Mr. Carballo, what's the point of a rubber membrane on a deck? Why is that uh, done? What's the purpose um, of it? it? Generally, because you want to use underneath that deck during the rain without getting wet. Okay. Uh, that's really generally the only reason why you do it. That makes sense. It just my deck doesn't have that. I was wondering why you would put a rubber membrane. Is, is this supposed to happen to different apartments? No. No. Okay. No. And this is only this is a, a deck off the second floor, okay. so it's eight and a half nine feet off the ground. Or other than the uh, injury to the wall, 
Is there any other contention you're making as to the problem with the deck coming back to meeting up with your property in any distance? It, it's basically the, ma the continual maintenance that these buildings need. You need to waterproof them um, sometimes almost every five years. Um, it's not just a one-time thing. But you're still talking about your wall? Yes. Okay, I'm talking about anything other oh. than the wall. Oh, that's a problem on the property? The co the, your, your concerns or your oh, objection with the deck. to the deck has to do with the injury to your wall and the maintenance of that wall, correct? Yes. Is there anything other than that that concerns you about the presence of the deck? Mm, probably the way the process was done and how it's um, continuously being supported in certain departments. <laughs> uh, that of that. Yeah, it has nothing means, to do with this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, anyway, to get back to why I think it does not also in the zoning code uh, 5-305, number 7, um, I do not feel that this supports that. Ms. Timport, just so that I'm clear, when did you purchase this property? Uh, about 10 years ago. So in two, around 2009? Uh, August of, yeah. And did you ever live in it? Uh, no. And when did you first discover the moisture in the in the home? I discovered it a couple of years ago, except I acquainted. A couple of years ago, meaning 2016, 2017, 2000, what's a couple Well, of there years? was always problems, but when you work on a building and look, you think the problem's always yours at first. So you first you start with the roof, and then you do this, and then you do that. And then, you know, you don't think, you would think that your neighbors are aware of problems on their side creating other problems, but that was a dumb thing to assume. So then when I came to the conclusion um, that the deck, I mean that the walls and the basement were getting damaged, um, I thought it was because the water flow on the two properties all flowed to the wall. That I've just recently discovered. Okay. The grading of that yard is um, of the two properties, probably because they were together, it all grades and the flow of water goes towards the wall instead of the way for the wall. It also ponds. The concrete has cracks in it. There's reasons water was coming into the building and I was assuming it was all due to 1723. I have invited Arkady into the house several times and I said, Arkady, you know, Nina has this capturement of the all these bricks it's retaining water against this wall so we got her finally last year to move this stuff but there's other issues there so it wasn't that I was trying to be I tried the work for a long time except you know I guess I assumed too much it was just this year that I decided I need to get up on the roof because I'm in two other water civil suits with a civil engineer, so I do have a little bit of background of work I need to do and what to look for. And I've taken my time to cut costs down, of taking my own readings, of getting on roof, documenting water flow, watching all this stuff, and there's a lot of issues here. And, uh, and then I found out that the majority of the problems of the up to 17, 20 feet of my wall, 20 feet in the basement, but less on the first floor, was due to grading and also this deck. So, um, of course, so anything I th would have thought that the deck would have been cut back to three feet. In fact, I wrote Arcadia a letter about cutting the deck back to three feet back in May, but I got a very nasty response. At that point, I waited. I thought maybe he'd cut it back, and he didn't, and then I had to do the 311 route in June. So they this is where this is all feet, They cut it back 18 inches. Yes. Your contention is that doesn't solve the issue that you thought might be resolved with a three feet cut back, right? Yes. Thank you. All right. I don't have any more. Any, anything else? I'm sorry. Anything else from you, ma'am? Um, that you have not <laughs> already <laughs> Maybe have some more presented. pictures or something really quick. I don't know. Again, I'm not asking you if the, to, to give no, me I understand. It's what it is you want to make a record of. Well, for the record, because if I have to appeal, I, I want to be prepared. <laughs> Okay, all I can keep saying is that it doesn't meet the criteria of uh, the grant of variance. Okay, thank you. Mr. Caballo, anything further from you, sir? I don't believe we have anything further. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, folks. Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, variance is written, the 1.7 feet. There's a difference, because that's what they're asking for. Yeah. We're off the record on okay. that one, unfortunately. I got a little.
Yeah. Um, we were off, right? Just one second. Yeah. You got it. I'll just have them come back up and do that. I'm going to recall the case of 2018-452. I'm not on the record. I'm, I'm sorry. Being... Just hang out, Mr. Woolman, for a second. Sorry. Technical difficulties. <laughs> sound like it's working. You know, kind of dead. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and um, uh, Mr. Court Reporter, uh, we're going to stay on the record. We're going to have our associate counsel take notes simply on the postponement request that's about to be given. Is that um, acceptable? Okay. Right, so, Mr. Mullman, I believe you're going to be requesting a postponement. Yes, thank, okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Mullman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, per my earlier comments, we had a chance to discuss the matter outside. Uh, for the record, we'd lack, like to ask for the matter be continued to, to the 8th of October. We're scheduling a meeting with the community on September 28th. Okay. So, um, we need to post, uh, continue it until that date. Uh, and for that reason, that I'm sorry? October 8th is closed off, unfortunately. We've set that docket day aside for a, a bundle of 58 cases. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, wow. So the uh, October 22nd would be the next yes. available yes. hearing date. Yes, that'll give us time to meet. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who is here in opposition or in support of this particular appeal, which is 2018 252 1743 North Washington Street? 2018 Four, 452. I'm sorry. All right. Um, do you agree to the continuance of this case, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Um, and what was your name? What was your last name, ma'am? I'm sorry. G R O S S. Okay. And uh, there's some folks out in the hallway that are aware of this as well, and we've agreed to the schedule. Okay. Um, the board has the discretion to grant a continuance uh, since the case was um, originally called um, at the board's uh, discretion. Any questions or objections? Okay, unanimously we agree to grant the postponement. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm ready to hear anything. Okay, great. (laughs) (laughs) Calling the case of 2019 265 1200 South Haven Street, Carolyn Hecker. To redevelop premises for mixed uses with retail, office, and two multi dwelling, multi family dwellings. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams and Ms. Hecker. For the record, Justin Williams from the law firm Rosenberg Martin Greenberg, on behalf of the applicant, joined by my colleague Carolyn Hecker and the civil engineer in the project, Melanie DeFazio, developer at Scheduling Conflicts. So sorry I couldn't be here. Okay. If you intend to present testimony, then maybe we can have you swear. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, do we have any staff reports for 2019 265? Thank you, yes. Planning Department has been working with this applicant. The site plan for this redevelopment of this site was reviewed and approved by the Site Plan Review Committee on August 26th of this year. The designs for Building 1 and Building 2, which are mentioned in this application, have been reviewed by the Urban Design and Architecture Advisory Panel and are continuing to work through the design review process. Preliminary site plan included with the application shows there would be a subdivision of this site into several new parcels to be divided by new public streets. And the department notes that all subdivision and subsequent development of this property requires planning commission approval. On that basis, the Department of Planning recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all construction, buildings, improvements, and landscaping are completed in accordance with subdivision and development plans approved by the Planning Commission. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Williams, if the board were to 
view favorably your application, are those conditions uh, cited by planning acceptable to your client? They are. Okay. Now tell us about your project. Sure. Um, I'll go briefly through the, um, the project. I know um, the board is a busy docket. Um, and if the board has any questions, Mr. Fazio can help answer any technical questions about the project. Um, I've included a packet of exhibits for your review about the project. Generally, we're here for two requests. Uh, relief for the height of certain buildings within this project we're proposing in the Canton area and for certain setback variances from Haven Street. Um, so I've included an aerial photo of the area in question, 1200 South Haven Street. It's across the street and there's an aerial photo from the Canton Crossing development. The same developer um, who developed that Canton Crossing development is now working on this project across the street, the north side of Boston Street. Included a street view photo as well showing the existing condition of the property. Not very uh, pleasant to the eye right now. I've also included the truck route map showing that Haven Street is a local truck route. <coughs> um, the port industry, um, trucks going to and from the ports use this uh, street a lot um, to get to and from the highway. Um, uh, okay. Included also a bike rails to trails map. The proposed rails to trails uh, system through Baltimore is going to run alongside the property. Um, Included exhibits showing where it's going to run through. Um, uh, the triangle area, which I'll go through in a minute, that's where the rails and trails route will go through the rest of the city. <coughs> uh, the area I've included also a old school aerial photo of the site. This is for the site of the former Standard Oil and Exxon refinery, um, the 130 acres total. And here's a quick excerpt of it. And from for over a century, it was one of the first, a country's first oil refinery projects in in the country and has a history of oil use going through the 80s and up until 2005 there's aerial showing the tanks that were there the, um, there were oil tanks in the property so the property has um, contamination issues and there's an MDE newsletter in the file for your review as well showing that 97 uh, Exxon entered into agreement with MDE to remediate the property and that's been going on the property since that time until now and because the uh, oil has been removed to such a point that the, I guess, MDEs has approved the site to be redeveloped now. So that's why we're here today. Um, last is a bit related to the oil. There's an existing conditions map showing the existing oil wells on the property proposed to be developed. And that's one of the drivers of the variance today is that there's existing monitoring wells that check the ground for oil and are pulling oil out of the ground. So the project is being built in phases and Buildings are being designed around monitoring wells to allow continued access to them until such time as they can be plugged. Um, and uh, other things for your review and the exhibits in the file. The current zone in the property is C2. During the transform Baltimore process, um, the council person for the first district agreed to uh, rezone the property to C2. It had, it had, had historically been industrially zoned, but in line, in line with the continued development of the area for commercial use and redevelopment, the property is rezoned to C2. And then finally, I've included an exhibit. So in the staff report from the Planning Commission hearing when the City Council amended the Canton Industrial Urban Renewal Plan to move this property out of the Industrial Urban Renewal Plan to allow for commercial mixed use development that's proposed today. So just briefly about the proposed development. I included a BBJ article um, showing the 12-acre site to be developed by Mr. Saperstein, Collective at Canton. It's a mixed-use development that will kind of continue the, the exciting developments going down a block south at Canton Crossing. Um, there's included as an exhibit an illustrative master plan, open space exhibit showing kind of the proposed layout of the site. <coughs> there's a 500-unit mass, a 500-unit apartment building proposed on the north end of the site a five-story, 19,000-square-foot office building, a hotel that has yet to be named, given a flag on the lower right-hand corner of the site, a uh, grocery store and retail building, bank building, and then also a mixed-use multifamily building on the lower left-hand side of the property. Um, <coughs> I guess n another driver of the variance, um, the applicant is working with BGE e to remove uh, overhead wires and poles that are along Haven Street, and they'll go underground um, Haven Street at the applicant's expense, and I'll show you the setback um, in, in the place they're proposing a wider landscaping along Haven Street, which is technically the front yard of the project. 
So because of the underground wires and because of the truck route that's proposed or that that's existing, the applicant has worked with the trucking uh, trade groups and the Maryland Port Authority to move the building and like the sidewalks back from Haven Street in a larger setback than is normally allowed in the C2 zoning district. Um, I included a letter of support from the Brewers Hill Neighbor Association for this request. Um, we've done extensive outreach with the community, the Canton Community Association, the Brewers Hill Neighbors Association, the Brewers Hill Community Association. Um, there's no, been no objection to the request today. And as Mr. French mentioned, we'll be going through the planning commission process for future design, review, and development of the project as well. Um, I can, we've included the exhibits that specifically identify the relief requested. The, um, I can go through it, or it's, uh, it's listed in front of you. The three buildings, well, there's four buildings that need height relief. The lower left hand corner is the mixed use retail building. That would be uh, ground level retail and apartment units upstairs. That requires conditional use approval to go a height above 60 feet. We're proposing it to be 70 feet. <coughs> uh, the multifamily building on the north side of the site, which is up against the O'Donnell Street overpass. It's supposed to be 85 feet. That requires a variance because it's not a mixed use building. The office building along Haven Street also requires a variance for height to be 85 feet in lieu of the, in lieu of the required 60. And finally, the hotel proposed also is proposed to be 85 feet. Um, and this exhibit, following exhibit of the rendering shows the buildings in line with other height, other building heights in the area and lower than the Natty Bow Tower or the existing building going up at the Alta Brewers Hills 95 feet. And in the light of that sort of lower threshold, the community didn't have any objections and no one's fully behind our site to have their view shed blocked. <coughs> the other variance requested, like I mentioned, is the setback issue. The second sheet for you shows the setback variances. Technically our front yard is Haven Street because we have a Haven Street address. And the C2 district, I think it might have been poorly phrased, it requires a it says there's no front yard setback required, but if there is one, it can be no more than five feet. Here, as I mentioned, that there's a truck route going up and down Haven Street, and there's a lot of work being done to move BGE poles underground. And because of the truck route, we're pulling things back. So we are proposing setbacks in, in excess of five feet. So the multifamily building will be that 10 feet, 10 feet setback from Haven Street. The office building is supposed to be 51.1 feet back. And the hotel is proposed to be 16.2 feet back from Haven Street. And the rendering, the last exhibit, now stop talking to you. The last exhibit shows the landscape and proposed, and there'll be a pleasant streetscape, and so it'll be filled in with walkable amenities for the community. Mr. Williams, um, when this application came in, there it was only a request for various um, height, either by conditional use or by variance. The yard setback wasn't part of the application. Is that Correct. being added today? It's being amended today. To so include the request for the setback variance. To like the board okay. to approve both. Okay. Because um, that th those just haven't been evaluated at all. So we don't we've never seen those plans. We don't know what those setbacks are or how that's impacted. Right. I mean, we, we request the board to I mean, approve it in light of the community support for the project, and that there will be future planning commission review of the entire master plan for the project and design review for the buildings. Okay. And then the notice, of course, was provided for for a hearing for this project. Yeah, sorry. And also, as Ms. Hecker mentioned, the UDAP process, uh, the design review panel has reviewed the building placement and the, set, and the setbacks proposed. And they understand that it's because of the monitoring wells and the Haven Street um, truck route negotiations that have been ongoing that we're moving the buildings back further than they otherwise would normally be. And when was that UDAP review? When was that held? <laughs> well, there's been multiple meetings. Um, the, there was a master plan meeting in June 29th, uh, the June, master, June, June UDAP, UDAP meeting in 2019. There's, uh, and then there's been other UDAP meetings for each particular building within the development. And so <laughs> that's correct. Um, I mean, th this is a large, large scale project that this is only the first step of many. Um, I I'm just 
we're trying to figure out if <laughs> uh, how that would work. Um, since the the the, the 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 application came in and the appeal requests uh, height variances for certain buildings and then uh, certain heights by conditional use, we just didn't have the information about any kind of setback issues. My understanding was that that may have to come back to the board for a future hearing if working through UDAP would move those buildings. Um, and I just, you know, what we, we only have the application that we have in front of us, which includes height only. Um, the board can certainly consider a request to add the setback variance that's requested here today, and then it's within the board's discretion to either say, you know, yes, we can review that, or no, we can't review that today, and you'd have to come back that for that at a later time, but I would leave that to the board. And if I can, I, I can't help myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg Martin, on behalf of the applicant as well. Um, in that vein, Mr. Bumgarner is correct. It was not included in the original application because the design has been evolving through this process with the planning department. Um, we have been very transparent with the community and the planning department about the, um, the location of the buildings and as they have shifted over time. Um, the signposting would not have changed for this hearing based on the additional request for setback variances. It would always be um, it, the, the standard language about the approval of the mixed-use project. The sign doesn't specifically identify the variances that are being requested. So from a notice perspective, the community and the public had exactly the same type of notice they would have they would have had if the variances for the setbacks had been included in the original application. Okay. All right, very well. Anything else, Mr. Williams? I have the factors for the variance and the commissioner's approval listed before you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to address them or go through them. Questions from the board? No. no. All right. I think we're good. Thank you for your presentation. Calling the case of 2019-268, 3600 Hudson Street, John Lipperini. Mr. Lipperini, uh, this is a request to demo existing first floor rear addition, construct two-story rear addition that contains a rear loading garage, and construct a rooftop deck with doghouse. Correct? Correct. Yes, sir. testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Lipperini, can you tell us about your project, sir? Uh, the, it's a corner, corner row home of 3600. It's an end unit next to an alley. Uh, we currently have a permit that we're working under to uh, gut and rehab the interior of the unit, which we started. Uh, the pr permit also allowed for a rear uh, deck off the second floor, uh, but we decided instead of doing that that we'd like to add in a second floor addition plus the garage underneath to provide garage parking. Okay. Mr. Chair, I apologize. But could you call on Mr. Joseph Shaw to see if he is still here who had signed uh, in in opposition? Is there a Mr. Joseph Shaw in the room? Apparently, he, in apparently room. he didn't stay. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Lipperini, are, are you aware of any? Uh, we have the name of Mr. Shaw who apparently signed in in opposition earlier. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any opposition to this project? I am not. I did meet with. Uh, I think it's his first name. He's, he's calling. He's Ray Shaw, but that might not be his uh, his uh, official name. And I did meet with him to discuss uh, what his concerns were, and satisfied. Okay. Uh, his concerns were not so much with the the zoning addition, but he had some some issues with regard to his own his own property and some issues he's dealing with as a neighbor. That's all. Understood. Um, do I take it that this uh, project is intended to cover uh, the entirety of the lot? Um, I believe so. I think we have a, is there a small setback? I'm not, that, uh, I didn't bring a copy of the plan, but I thought that we came 
to within two, two feet of the back with the garage. Okay. That's our intent anyway. Any questions? No. Okay. <coughs> Anything you'd like to add, Mr. Liparini? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Calling the case of 2019-270, 240 South Crescent Street. Elisa Hertzmark. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, this is a request to construct a new building to be used for motor vehicle service and repair. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, raise your right hands. We swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I affirm. Okay. And do we have any staff reports for 2019-270? Yes, thank you. Planning Department has reviewed this application, uh, noting that there may be a required review by the Site Plan Review Committee. The department recommends approval of the application be subject to the condition that all construction improvements and landscaping are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hertzmark, uh, having heard the comments from planning, uh, to the extent we're favorably disposed to your application, are those conditions acceptable to your client? Yes, they are. Tell us about your project, please. Sure. Um, so the uh, site is on South Crescent Street. Um, and it's, it's south of Lombard, north of Eastern Avenue. Um, there are a few cross streets between those, but they don't uh, go through the site. Um, the existing site is vacant, and we're proposing to construct a motor vehicle service and repair, a major motor vehicle service and repair facility. Um, the proposed building will have four service bays. Um, we're meeting all bulk regulations for minimum lot area. There's no height requirement. We're meeting all the yard requirements, and we're meeting the vehicle parking requirements. Um, I have a um, few exhibits I want to add just about the general um, zoning and site around it. Um, as you can see on this zoning map, mm -hmm. um, the site is pretty squarely in the middle of an I-2 zone. Um, all of the surrounding properties are I-2 as well, so it is a heavy industrial area. Um, here is an aerial as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that all of the existing, all the surrounding sites also have large industrial buildings, big open parking spaces, lots of trucks and concrete. Um, mm -hmm. So we believe that the use very much fits within um, that industrial area, which we also know is meant to stay industrial. Um, Furthermore, uh, as part of the development, we are subject to stormwater management requirements. Our proposed stormwater management, which is being reviewed by DPW, is to reduce impervious area within the disturbed area by 50%. Um, so we'll be adding a significant amount of green space, planting space, and therefore reducing water runoff from the site as well. Um, so we feel that the project we are bringing very much fits within the neighborhood, and our development will actually improve the site and the area. Any questions from the board? Nope. Questions? All right. Yep. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. <coughs> All right. Following the case of 2019 275, 1345 Gorsuch Avenue. Saramati Ballroom. This is a request to house two dwelling units, is that correct? That's correct. It's an existing two dwelling unit. Uh, could we swear the parties, please? Okay. Whether you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah, Are you Sarah that. Maddie Ballram? Yes. Okay. And do we have any staff reports? Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have an email that was sent to our office that's, that is part of the record. It says, I live near this residence, and it's being used as three units on the first floor, the second floor, and, base, and, and basement apartments. I made a complaint a few months ago when the city computer system was down via 311, advising that there are two adults and two children living in this basement apartment, which, which is really scary since there's only one way out and one way in. The previous tenant that rented the basement was robbed. 
and apparently the assailants waited for her to come in the backyard after dark and forced her way in and robbed, uh, robbed her in the basement area. She moved a month later and the new family subsequently moved in. This is a hazard for children um, and after the sign for this appeal was placed on the home this weekend, uh, according to this letter, they took the third mailbox down. Uh, it's not signed. It's signed as a concerned homeowner. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted the application states the premises has been and is currently licensed as a multifamily dwelling containing two dwelling units. This property is in the R6 zoning district, a district in which conversion of a single family unit to a multifamily dwelling is not authorized by the zoning code. Therefore, the board must determine whether the premises is or is not a multifamily dwelling. The department has no objection to this application if the applicant demonstrates that there is continuing use of the premises as a multifamily dwelling containing two dwelling units. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your okay. application. Okay, my application. Evidence of its use as a two-unit yeah. multi. In multi 2004, we purchased it as a two-dwelling unit. And ever since it's been operating as a two dwelling, I've been paying a registration for the last 15 years for two dwelling units with, the, with licensing. In 2018, December, when I was supposed to renew it and you had to do it online, it showed up as $30. I called licensing and asked why, because I always pay $60 for two units and they said they have it as one. And I said, but I always pay $60 for the last 14 years, since 2004. You paid every year? Every year, $60, yes. A licensing registration fee. I even paid the MDE, the $15 per unit for two dwelling units. Now it's $30, and I've been paying it for the last 15 years. Okay. Um, where are the, are the units on the first and second floor? Yeah, it's a first floor, it's a second floor, and it has a basement, yes. And it ha I have two gas meter, two electric meter, everything. I pay two gas and two electric with BG&E. Uh, but here, showing the gas. Okay. Showing the electric. I have my BG&E bill, which specified first and second. Is that a current bill? Um, yeah, it was from me that I gave in the, um, which is, I'm still paying it, but this is from way where I had submit the zoning to give them a copy for the file. So I bought the same thing. Okay. Yeah, but I'm currently paying for two, yes. Okay. Okay. This is from April of 2019? Yes. I even had it inspected in December of 2018 as two dwelling unit for the licensing, which was submitted. Have it here by Tripoli Ackerman. Thank you. So, Ms. Ballroom, uh, I have the registration, the, the property registration, which is separate from zoning for 2019. I think this is what you just referred to. It was inspected on December 22nd, 2018, and it's noted here as a single family dwelling. And then, uh, again, these are simply city records. What I also have here, excuse me. Sorry, Bryson, for smacking the microphone. Um, it looks like in 2018, the property, I'm sorry, so 2019, the property was registered as single family. In 2017, the property was registered as single family. And then in 2016, the property was registered as, tw as two dwelling units, as well as 2009. Those were the only records available. Um, so th there's a bit of a disjuncture between what you're saying that you register the property as. And again, registration is separate from zoning. They're two different things. But the, the city records show at least two years in the last five, the property was registered as a single family dwelling. Well, I have from 2004 when I owned it mm -hmm. to 2017 where you pay for 18. It says it came from the city as two dwelling units. I even have the 2004 that, and I have all the records for all the years that I've been paying the $60 as the registration fee towards the city. Uh, Mr. Baumgartner, the registration, which references a single family dwelling? Correct. Who signs that document? 
Um, I don't know the individual, but they're issued by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, property registration, they don't review zoning. So if you say it's a two family dwelling, they go to inspect to see if there's two kitchens, two bathrooms, but they don't cross reference it with any use permit that may or may not have been issued. Ms. Edmonds came out about in September, August, and she did inspect it as two dwelling, did take pictures that it has two dwelling units, and she's the one who in, informed me to go to use an occupancy to go because zoning has it as one to apply, and then I did the use of occupancy, and then I had to go and do the appeal for the registration to show it, sorry, for a multi-family dwelling, because I show her my records that I've been always paying up to 2017, paying the $60 for two dwelling units. When you purchased the property in 2004, um, were there two entrances into each, I'm sorry, was there one entrance into each dwelling? Yes. Okay. Was there one kitchen per dwelling? Yes. Was there at least one bathroom per dwelling? Yes. Okay. The city has no record of that work ever being done legally. Mm -hmm. So I, I have no doubt that the, the building is currently structured in that way, mm -hmm. but whoever did that work did it w without a permit and did it illegally. So that's what brings us here today. Um, and I can anticipate what the community is gonna testify to that un unfortunately, the only record the city has is, uh, of that property is being a single family dwelling and the zoning code does not allow this board to convert a single family into a multi-family in this zoning district. So things like the meters uh -huh. are helpful okay. in establishing that at some point in time, there was the lawful use of two dwelling units, uh -huh. but the board would have to be convinced that that evidence was sufficient to establish that at some point in history, the property was lawfully uh, turned into two dwelling units and that a piece of paper with a permit just got lost to time. But that's what you would have to show and that's what the board would have to find to allow you to continue it as what it's structurally designed as. So I just wanted to kind of lay that foundation and then you can certainly continue your presentation and give the board evidence to show anything that would indicate that the, that the property had lawfully been converted at some point in history to two dwelling units. So would that mean the registration that I have since I've been paying, is we're not talking that since 2004 that I owned it? So property registration, unfortunately, is simply a fee. Oh, okay. It doesn't impact zoning. Uh, it's certainly evidence of possibly a prior use Okay. Um, but it, it doesn't go to um, the lawful prior use or current use of the property. Um, yeah. Even though there, I when I purchased it, it was two gas meter, two electric. Everything was two. I didn't do. I didn't do nothing. Sure, correct. And that's certainly your testimony, and the board would take that into account okay. in evaluating the case. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to I explain why you're here. Um, and the standards that the board would have to apply to either approve or disapprove the application. Um, but you may, you're welcome to continue um, if you have any other evidence. Is there anything else you'd like to submit or, or no. state in support of your application? Madam? No, that's, okay. that's it I have, yeah. The right. Two meters and yeah, that's okay. it. So we'll turn to uh, the opposition. Thank you. Good afternoon, Stephanie Murdoch, Office of Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Uh, the Councilwoman could not be here today, but she did ask me to read into the record her opposition to this appeal. This property is zoned as R6 General Residential District in the current zoning code. A conversion of a single family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling is allowed only in the R7, R8, R9, and R10 districts. Conversions are not allowed in R6. This appeal requires a conversion. This appeal should not be viewed as a continuation, however illegally it may have operated uh, with two or more dwelling units after housing's rental registration records indicate a change in status from two dwelling units to a single family dwelling as of July 29th, 2017, a status still in effect. 
Whatever meters and layout remain from the single family dwelling two plus years ago should not be accepted as legal evidence that this appeal is for anything but a conversion, which R6 prohibits. This honorable board has a long history with the Coldstream Homestead Montebello communities encouraging efforts to maintain its properties as single family dwellings for affordable home ownership. An effort to balance home ownership stability with the investor multifamily rentals now threatening to dominate. 1345 Gorsuch is a solid block in a safe and welcoming environment right across the street from Abbotston Elementary School, one of the neighborhood's two state-rated four-star schools. Investors in 1345 Gorsuch are urged to rehab as a single-family dwelling for affordable home ownership, removing the remaining evidence of long-gone multifamily status. Many public and private subsidies are in place in the neighborhood, including Johns Hopkins University's recent inclusion of CHUM in its Live Where You Work program. Uh, and again, she apologizes for your absence and her absence, and thank you for your consideration. And here are some copies of her letter for the record. Very well. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Uh, Ma'am, would you care to be heard any further? Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I'm going to um, recall that. Thing. Let me go back in time for a moment here and recall a case that was called earlier uh, for which there was a, an apparent no show. Case number 2019-272-1313 West 42nd Street. Mitch Maltese. He was here. He was here. Uh, Who's the other? I think the next one was Mr. Uh, oh, he was? That's where he was. The other judge. No. no, I thought I called. Did I call that one? I called the consent. He didn't show up. I think he was the no show. Right. He, was. he was. He was the no show. But 246. I'll call that one again. Trujillo, is it? 246 is the no show. Yeah. Okay, all right. Did he show up? I thought I called this one for the consents and he didn't <coughs> yeah. show up. 2019, 272. He said he was here. He was here? No, I wrote he was here. Did he, did we already? Yeah, he was here. Okay. All right, sorry about that. So. 246. 2019, 246, 921 Crescent. Okay. All right. Next calling the case of 2019 282, 426 Grundy Street. Richard Hayslip? Uh, no. Victor De La Cruz, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Skipped one. Uh, Mr. De La Cruz, this is a request to continue use of the ground floor as a carry-out food shop. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Do we have any staff reports? Yes. Planning Department notes this property is located in the Highland Town business area, urban renewal area where the urban renewal plan does not prohibit or further restrict the proposed use. However, the applicant should consult Part D of that urban renewal plan, referred to as property rehabilitation standards, prior to designing or installing any changes to the facade of the property. On that basis, the Department of Planning recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all exterior changes and improvements to the property are completed or installed in accordance with plans and designs approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Mr. De La Cruz, uh, having heard from planning, are those conditions acceptable to you? Excuse me? What Mr. French just said, as a condition for approval uh, by planning, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes. You can agree to those things? Yes. Uh, can you tell us about your project? Yes. Tell me about your, your project and your application. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, it's going to be a small restaurant. And I'm planning to run in seven, seven days a week to sell food from my country. Okay, seven days a week. Yes. What, what are your proposed hours for the, for the carryout shop? It's going to be like <coughs> six in the morning to 
From eight nine. To midnight. Yep. Okay. Where there'll be um, will there be alcohol served? I'm not planning that no okay. right now. Because it wouldn't be allowed. So you should say no. <laughs> okay. No. I know. So you shouldn't be planning that, right? <laughs> it's good what that you're not planning. <laughs> um, what type of food? Uh, Spanish food, Dominican food. Dominican food, okay. Yeah. Will there be any sit-down seats, tables? Yeah, it's going to be a couple of chairs, yeah. Like a counter, counter. A counter? Yeah, a counter. Is that what was that space most recently operated as? If you know what is what what exists there now? Is can you can you speak a little? Yeah, is it operating now? Is anything? No, no. Okay, it's not operating now. It's vacant. Yes. Okay. You own the building? No. So your hours are 6 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week. That's what we're trying to. So you breakfast, lunch, dinner every day? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any additional questions from the board? No. All right. Mr. Dela Cruz, thank you for your presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, calling the case of 2019-283, 312 Tuscany Road, Richard Heslip, to construct a two-story side addition. Mr. Heslip? Here for Mr. Heslip. I'm an employee of his. My name is Thomas Bachman. Okay. Uh, is Mr. Heslip going to be here? Uh, no, he's actually out of town. Okay, so you're standing in for Mr. Heslip. Very well. Um, okay. Let me swear the witness. Swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, yes, sir. And do we have any staff reports for 312 Tuscany Road? Planning Commission, pardon me, Planning Department <laughs> has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have uh, an individual who signed in actually for uh, this property, uh, Ms. Linda Eberhardt. Is she here? Ma'am, you would need to come forth and it looks like there was a bit of a confusion um, Miss Eberhardt signed in um, um, in support of this appeal this oh, this okay. property was originally <laughs> on the consent agenda uh, so the board can simply uh, can certainly hear it on consent at this time okay um, but and we have yeah. no opposition so we can hear it on consent we had you on here as in opposition but you you were right we were wrong <laughs> so I live, across, I live across the street right and it just came to Support my motion. Gotcha. So we can hear all the sentence. Okay, fine. Um, can we just say there's no, they have no comment on this? Correct. 312. All right. Well, lucky day. Uh, <laughs> 2019 283 312 Tuscany Road. Um, the board having sufficient information to approve your appeal. Well, the board having heard your appeal, I believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, it's all right. Yes. Uh, we'll call the case of 2019-289, 4122 St. Thomas Avenue. Sir Thomas Donovan? Yes. Okay. And we have this as a request to construct privacy fence around the perimeter of the property. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. We had letters in opposition, but no somebody signing in, right? Correct. All right. Can you swear the witness, please? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing? Yes. Do we have any staff reports? I have a letter in the file uh, signed by the president of the Walterson Improvement Association. This letter is written in response to the request to build a seven to eight foot high fence around the property at 4122 St. Thomas Avenue. At this time, our Walterson, Walterson Improvement Association is against this request. Reasons for this are twofold. First, the request was made after the fence was already constructed. 
In addition, observations show that the fence, which is over the legal limit in size, is incongruous with the style of the neighborhood and the visual impact of the fence may adversely impact neighbors. If the petitioners would like, they're welcome to attend a community meeting or contact us directly to discuss our decision. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Do you have any pictures of the fence? Solid like this. It's um. That's the back. That's the that's the most important part. And this, it's a severe slope, so it goes from six foot to eight foot, then cuts back to seven in the middle, and then the front is only six foot. And um, I already um filled out a permit with e permits, and I was here. That's in February. Here in zoning? Yeah, I was, I was just here talking. I've seen you. You're over there, though. Um, yeah, promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I was under the impression I could have six foot in front, six foot in the back, and the in between could be six to eight foot. And Where did you get those impressions, sir? It was already uh, approved. By whom? Uh, Amit Shahid and Charles Lee. And they already issue, issued the, the permit for that. For those heights? Yeah. And the, the, the reason was because I have a taxi cab there and it's constantly broken into. Yes, sir. And the, my front porch gets gets um, walked on and stolen stuff off of it. And kids come in and fight in my front yard. And it's a severe slope. So they, they could pretty much hide from my view. So. Sir, you were here in February of this year for a shed on the side of your property. Th that's what, what they said I needed to do was for, for everything I want to be done, mm -hmm. is get the approval for the shed because I want to put that on the side property within 10 foot of the, of the side property. That was approved and the height of the fence was approved. I got even paid for the permit. But it wasn't approved because you're here. So the, the, the well, because it may be because of that letter, maybe. No, the, 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 the process is uh, in order to get before this board, your permit has to be denied. So this permit was denied by the zoning office. So you were approved for a shed yeah, in February. It says on the, on the um, permit. Sure. Well, th but about the fence, all, all 243 linear feet. But was the plan for the fence and the heights yes. Every, part of the package? All, all in the file. Every detail. <clears throat> well, uh, I think part of the problem is we're having trouble wondering why the board would have approved a seven and six, seven and eight foot fence when it's clearly beyond the the allowed height. And I recall a side shed on the side of the property. I do not recall the presentation well, in support of the fence. That. Hold on, hold on. Okay, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do not recall the presentation of the height with the, the the fence with those heights, uh, and certainly don't recall the approval of that. And, and were you about to say that because I didn't present about the fence? They told me at, at the stop. They who's they? Charles Lee, Amit Shahid, all all superintendents of the of the zoning office on Fayette Street. Six foot in the front, six foot in the back. Side fence, you know, because the slope could, could go from six to, to eight down to seven for a privacy, which I really need in the neighborhood because it's deteriorating and just having too, too much crime. Um, like I say, all 243 linear feet is on the, on the um, approval of and the permit issued by the department. I mean, it's, it's all on file. What I'm having trouble understanding is is how did you get here? So did the zoning office instruct you to file the appeal? Uh, they, they, or? A building inspector came by, put one of the orange signs on my, uh, the fence is already up. I, mm -hmm. I've been living in peace for the last, you know, four or five months. What's the orange sign say? 
it says stop work when it's already done, though, because I already got approved. And, and, and on the approval, the fence is approved. Well, I think it, it we have to approve. I think zoning, this board, has to approve that. So evidently, it was approved. <laughs> I, I would have I came in before but with the shed because I, I, I come in for the shed. I understand the shed. And, and now they call pretty well the shed okay. and, and, and walking through that process. Um, but if there was a fence issue, particularly one, when did you build the fence? Fence was put up around February. When you thought you had the approval or yeah. before you had the approval? Before you thought you had the approval? Before anything, they, they told me what to do. So I, I did exactly what they said. And the you issue. them to say you could go ahead and build your fence. Yes. So I think I, I think I understand what happened. The appeal before the board for the shed contained uh, a diagram that had the shed dimensions and that was approved. On that diagram, it says fence, 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 but there's no heights of the fence. So when you filed for your permit, the zoning office said, yes, you can build this, assuming that the fence would be the height that is allowed under code where you put fence, fence, fence. So when you applied for a permit, I'm sorry, so then you built your fence, and then however you got here, I still don't quite understand that part of it in terms of the process by which you, by which you got before the board. That's when you submitted the drawing showing the six to eight foot height on the front and then the eight foot in the rear. So what was approved was a what's called a by right fence, meaning that I can put a fence in the front of my property that's four and a half feet high. You need a permit, but you can just do it like with that permit. But if I were to put a six foot fence in my front yard, I would need a, a permit to put a six foot fence, not just a fence. So well, that I, was I, for the shed. Correct, but the, the permit you applied for for the fence that, says yeah. all work to be done according to Baltimore City Code and per submitted sketch. And uh, under that permit That is wasn't the sketch on that, that one, though. Okay. All that aside. I think I'm trying to help you out here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All that aside, uh, you're here now, and you have a very tall fence. So can you explain to the board the height of the fence, the location of that height, and the need for that fence? Okay. Did you want to show us photos? Huh? Should a photo of the, here's. Yeah. Is that in the back or the front? Do you need more photos? No, we got this. I, I, I submitted all the all that. This one. I can tell you this is what we have. Yeah, we don't have any photos of the fence. We have this aerial view. But I can tell you that if you presented anything about a fence that's beyond the allowable heights, we certainly would have questioned you about the need for that, which is what it is we're doing. Okay, here, here's, a, here's another photo showing the slope where it kind of gets gradually higher on the side. <laughs> but without, without the, it getting this gradually higher, it, it... So, just looking, here. sir? Yes. Am I facing the You're house? facing the back still. So this tall fence is, on the other side of this fence is someone's home? Yes. What's the height of the fence in the photograph that Mr. Baumgartner is holding? This one. That's six foot. It's six foot in the back and six foot in the front. That's a, that's a six foot fence? That's six That foot. looks more like an eight foot fence. That's six. Yeah. Really? It is. What about and, this? And that's a gate that you're showing there? Yeah. What about the side fence? Here's another photo. What about the fence the on height the side? On the side. The height of the side fence is an average of seven foot. It gradually it, it goes to eight, but it cuts it cuts down to seven foot on the front of the on the front edge of the house. On the rear. That's why I showed you the detailed drawing. Uh, I have that. We have that in our packet. The, the purple says what the height is. Yes, sir. Okay. That's probably the. Without that, people can just step on top of the fence and walk over. It's a very steep slope. And like I said, I've been living in peace, not having people bouncing basketballs in my yard and having an excuse to you know, steal stuff off my property. 
It's, it's been very peaceful. Did you issue police reports or anything to document what you've been through? I called the police um, on the second or last time that my, my car was, was broken into. And I was so disappointed to wait an hour for them to show up that um, the next time I had a broken window, you know, I just just figured it's part of the neighborhood. I mean, I, I've been, li like I said, I drive a taxi cab for a living and it, it's an easy target. They wait for me to come home and it, I'm always looking over my shoulder if someone's, you know, waiting for me to come home and, and rob me and, and they wait for me to go in the house and they, they break my window and, and steal stuff out of my car. I, I park in the back parking pad in closest to my house. And th that was no good. And then I parked in the front of my house and since it's a, s a steep slope, I can't really see my car. That was easier for them to steal, steal from. So now that I got this protection, I, I haven't had any problem for the last four months. Is this the back gate that you were refer referencing where you parked? Yeah, that's in the cab. I, could, I completely can park there without people seeing, seeing you know, what I'm doing. How deep is that from the fence to, I don't even know what I'm looking at here. What's the, what's the height of the fence here on the side? You're looking at about uh, s maybe seven and a half foot at that point. And is the difference because of the grade? It, it, it's, it goes from where you pointed at what was the very top of my yard and it's about 12 foot down to the front of my yard. So it's very steep. So parking in front of my house, I, I've had abandoned vehicles, you know, perfect place to park abandoned vehicles and it's just a lot of, a lot of potential for crime in the front. Your house is connected and to the another back. Sir, huh? Sorry, your house is connected to another house, correct? It's or a duplex, yes. A duplex, okay. And so on the other side, the house that it's connected to, does it have a, a big fence like yours or is yours the only one that has that fence? My, my neighbor ha also has a six foot fence in the front of his house. He's, he's been um, you know, stolen from, he had bicycles taken off his property. He's installed an eight camera video uh, system, you know, and he's, he's having um, success in, in reduction of crime. But just last week, the neighbor behind me got robbed at gunpoint and my neighbor in the front has a shed, had stuff stolen out of it. All, all within one, you know, two days. Okay. And detectives walking up and down the alley asking questions, looking for evidence. So, so I Mr. Feel, Donovan. I feel protected now. Um, I'm looking at the gate that's attached to the fence and the gate extends above the fence, correct? I mean, I can see like the, the gate, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just, you can understand why in a residential neighborhood, folks might not want what looks like a commercial almost like a contractor's yard gate in their neighborhood. Um, I, mean, I, I just, it's a very substantial gate. <laughs> um, I don't think they were really complaining about the gate though. I don't think they were. Okay. Have you had any conversations with the community association? Everybody, everyone says it's a beautiful fence and they, they were supporting me. Do you have any documentation of that? <laughs> well, I put a big sign on my house for this hearing and everything. There's no no one's opposing that. I mean, that's a letter. Correct. There's a letter. Yeah, I'm in opposition. Maybe okay. no one's opposing it because it was already there. The, who, the, the neighborhood association opposed it. Walton Correct. Son? Yes. Yeah, you, you heard that, were you aware that they had written a letter? I hadn't, was not aware of that. Um, that's not from an individual, that's from the Neighborhood Association. Association, but like I say, that this neighborhood is really de degrading. Um, there's houses with blue, blue tarp on the roofs, it, it abandoned properties. Um, it makes it easy for crime, let's put it that way. And me driving a cab for a living it's very, very dangerous for me to come home at night. Anything else you'd like to add, sir? Let's see.
Did you ever meet with the community association? No. I, I never really met with them, and, it's, and they're not really, really um, apparent in the neighborhood. They're, they're not really making them make themselves known. So, like I said, I had um, my grill stolen, uh, tools stolen, had gasoline stolen. Um, How long have you lived there? Uh, Thirty-five years. And when did all this these all stuff this take started place? back in 2013? That's, that's when I first first had my first break into my cab, my um, first thing stolen off my property, um, and it, five times my car has been broken into. One time I've been robbed, and you know, three times you know stuff stolen <coughs> off my property in my front porch. And like I say, the kids are playing basketball. They bounce their ball in my yard. It gives them a good reason to come in. And then they start fighting in my yard. They can easily get in, you know, because my front yard is, is sloped like steep. And they can e easily get in the front yard and start fights and, you know, do drugs, whatever they're doing, without me seeing them. So. Did you ever I, just. I really want protection. <coughs> ever uh, determined to put cameras in your. I got some. When I get enough money, I'm going to do that. But I got, I got oh, some. Did you price cameras versus the cost of a seven and eight foot fence and a nine foot gate? Well, it doesn't stop them with the camera with cameras. The, the fence does, you know, physically stop them. Right. Like I said, I'm not a violent person. I just want, want protection, and that's the, that's the easiest way I, that I feel like it could be done. Um, like I said, they're very bold. I mean, I'm I'm outside out back cooking, and they stop the car, try my car door, and they take off without me even with me standing in the yard okay but they're very they're very bold and i think the record's clear about this but you did not start this process with a i'll call it a regulation size fence which is a fence by right which is what four and a half feet in the front in the six front in the side and six in the rear well i had a, a existing fence mm -hmm. getting old but all they did was just step on top of it because it's it's very very steep slope okay it's new protection okay there's not, no further questions from the board? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, that's for the record. Following the case of 2019 291, 623 Luzerne, I'm sorry. Yeah, 623 South Luzerne Avenue, Anthony Williams. And this is a request to add outdoor dining and live entertainment to existing tavern. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, okay. You guys raise your right hands, please. We swear or affirm the testimony of the prosecution this morning is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, do we have any staff reports? I have a letter in the file from the Camp Community Association. It says, we, we received notice that the above application was filed and at the time we understood it to be just for outdoor seating. Since receiving the notice, we, pro we have provided the owner of the subject property and the current tenant who will be operating a restaurant tavern with a copy of the Canton Community Association Outdoor Seating Guidelines, a copy that's attached to this letter. A principal of the tenant, uh, Jamie Sutherland, has advised that their business intends to fully comply with these guidelines. Under these circumstances, we will support the application for outdoor seating, provided that the attached outdoor seating guidelines are made part of the board's resolution authorizing this conditional use. However, we must advise the board that the Canton Community Association opposes the application for live entertainment at this time. We hope to meet with the applicant in the next meeting of our committee and negotiate a memorandum of understanding setting forth mutually agreed upon conditions and limitations on the proposed live entertainment, which we will then submit to the board. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the R8 zoning district. This is a district which does not permit live entertainment, accessory to a restaurant or a tavern. It also does not permit uh, outdoor dining. The application does not make clear what the purpose of the seating is for outdoor, but if the purpose is for outdoor dining, then that would not be approvable in this district. 
The department therefore recommends disapproval of the application for live entertainment because the zoning code does not authorize live, live entertainment, whether or not accessory to a restaurant or tavern in the R8 zoning district where the property is located. As the application does not state the purpose of outside seating, as it's described in the application, the department notes that if it is intended for outdoor dining use, that use is also not a permitted use in the R8 zoning district. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams. Mm -hmm. um, having heard from planning and what the code does not allow, which seems to be both of the items that you're seeking to add, mm -hmm. um, tell us your position about that. Well, we believe that um, we're in the neighborhood that two blocks down the street is a different zoning. Yes, sir. <laughs> which makes no sense. Well, the zoning has to cut off somewhere, right? I mean, it's, I mean two blocks down the street, they're doing they're, they're in a they're in a residential neighborhood also, which is they're 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 attached to houses next to restaurants, which is the same situation. But we're not even attached to a rest. We're not even attached to a home, and we're not disturbing any homes in the neighborhood. What's well, a couple things. That one, not aware of what address you're speaking of mm -hmm. and what specific zoning attaches to that six address. Six twenty threes. South Luzerne. Well, that's your property. Yeah. But you're speaking of something two blocks down the road. Oh. That you say is treated. Well, I'm saying is. Has to be treated there's the same. several restaurants right around the corner, which are two, literally two blocks away, which are literally attached to each home in the same neighborhood. I don't have the exact names of the bars, but I can get that to you. But. That may be zoned differently than your neighborhood and your premises. If there, particularly if there are several restaurants around, your your zoning is what R eight. Okay, um, again, I don't know what restaurants you're talking about and what address locations they are, but where six twenty three South Luzerne Avenue rests is R eight, and the zoning code specifically or expressly prohibits outdoor dining and live entertainment in that district. That's why we were coming for um, a variance. Well, I don't, we can't give you those variants with regard to a, an express zoning exclusion. That's not something to vary. It's basically, we're saying we're going to excuse the code, the express provisions of the code that won't allow the very thing you want to do. I mean, that was the point of, and the code was what, changed in 2017? I mean, it's very new. Um, and so a number of things were taken into account as to what's going to go where and what's going to be allowed in that particular zoning district. and. Unfortunately, again, the very items that you're seeking to to add here are the very items that they have expressly excluded from as a possibility in that particular district. Um, so the board, we don't we don't have authority, frankly, to basically turn the zoning code on its head and say, all right, we're going to suspend the zoning code for. This so who has the ability to rezone an area? The Baltimore City Council. Baltimore City Council, who just did it in 2017. But I can tell you that your property is right in the middle of a huge R8 swath. Every property, probably three to 4,000 properties around you are all residentially zoned. There's a heavy commercial uh, three blocks south, but that's the main kind of Canton area. Uh, the can company and the shopping center, that that's all commercially zoned. So you could do all these things in a commercial zone, but you are buried right in the middle of one of the densest residential districts in Baltimore City. You should be able to get 12 permits a year, though. I mean, you don't have them, but you should be able to get 12 permits for live music. Like special event permits. Per special event permits. So that would be one a month. Can I say something? I'm, I'm what was your name, ma'am? Jamie Sutherland. That's right. And I'm on there. And um, I had been talking to the Canton Community Association, as they said in the letter, and they actually are for and supporting the seating for us. I'm not sure why they didn't know that we were asking for live entertainment because it's clearly stated on the board outside. However, we don't want to be a nuisance bar. Like, we want to make the neighborhood happy, but it's really hard to get business when, first of all, like the seating is more for to draw attention to the corner actually you know what I mean because we need like something that pops it's not like and it as far as the live music goes and so forth it was more for like to have on Wednesday nights from like 8 to 10 um, 
karaoke or something because we need or sports bar so we're, it's not like we're gonna have you know and we don't have the size to have large bands or anything it's just more like we have the only way we're going to succeed is if we have something that competes with who is around the corner from us so ma'am the there are cases that the board hears where things like live entertainment and outdoor dining are called a conditional use and then the board has the discretion to either grant it or deny it this is not one of those cases the board has no discretion whatsoever to approve either live entertainment or outdoor dining because of this property's location so, I mean, unfortunately, this isn't one of the, a case where the board can agree with you and say, yes, this sounds like a great idea. We're, we're hemmed in by what the code tells us, and unfortunately, both of those uses, the zoning code explicitly says you cannot have this. So, but you're saying, oh, sorry. I didn't no, sure. sure. But you're saying that we can do a conditional use permit? No. no. Not in this district. We're, he, what he's saying is there are some circumstances when someone comes to us like you that operates a business that would like to add outdoor dining or live entertainment and it's a conditional use it's in a in a zoning district that allows conditional use operations like the there. 12 like those maybe the three blocks down the road right that's not where you presently reside um, this is not one of those districts where it's a conditional use it's a an express prohibition on that activity. So my question is, are you conditionally trying to close these bars down, or do you not want so them in the neighborhood? I'm just asking a question. Well, no. you're asking a question I can't answer for you, sir. This is a zoning that you come for variances. It's not one we can express, we can grant a variance for. We don't have authority to undo the authority that the, or, or the mandate that the, that was laid out by the city council in establishing the new zoning code. Um, again, it's just a matter of where your property resides in the zoning district. And the 12 um, cases that she was talking about, so can we have to be zoned differently to even get the 12? No, you just have to have a liquor license, I think, to get the special events okay. permits. Okay. And you get, I mean, I, I don't know what the form exactly says, but you so we can. can apply for 12 special event permits a year. Okay. All right. That makes uh, sense. Okay. We'll go with that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, as a it's not necessarily compromised because again there's no authority that we have to grant your request but in alternative ways to get to what it get is you're looking for we just want an opportunity to make a living yeah and that so. that may be part of the mm -hmm. you know efforts to uh, achieve that uh, those opportunities uh, so where do we get the um where do we apply for the special permit special event permits are obtained by uh, from the department um, of housing and uh, community development so if you do special event permits, Baltimore City, um, the there's one of two phone numbers that should pop up, and you would call them and then request their form. Great. Appreciate that makes it. Sense. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. your presentation. You guys have a great day. Take Thank care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Calling the case of 2019-291, 2007 through 2009 Eastern Avenue, Josh Plevey. I'm sorry, 292. 2019-292. Mr. Plevy or Plevy? Plevy. Plevy. Uh, this is a request to construct a third floor addition, rooftop deck, and use for two dwelling units, correct? Yes, sir. All right. I swear the witness. Can I read your hand, please? We swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Do we have any staff reports? Yes, thank you. Planning Department has reviewed this application. It describes the use to be uh, to become a multifamily dwelling containing two dwelling units. There would be specific variances required which are described in the application and in the review done by the staff. The property is located in the Fells Point Historic District and the department notes that all exterior changes including additions, demolitions and alterations are subject to review and approval by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. The department therefore recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all construction improvements and alterations are completed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation and with Chesapeake Bay critical area requirements, noting that this property is also in the Chesapeake Bay critical area. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Plevy, I just want to start out with a question because uh, I'm trying to decipher some word construction here. Mm -hmm. 
Does the property currently has two dwelling units? So it was two dwelling units at one point converted into one for what I think is for, uh, for commercial use. Okay. So we want to reconvert them back to two. For a total of two units? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. so it's not that we're going to construct a third floor addition, two dwelling units in the third floor, plus whatever you had on the floor. No, floor. so it's two dwelling units addition on each unit. Okay. Uh, that just confused me again. So how many total dwelling units do you intend to have? Two. Two. But each of them will have an addition, or we're proposing that or asking for that. <laughs> All right, um, let's start again. Um, two dwelling units, that's it? Or you're saying each dwelling unit will then be able to be subdivided into another? No, one? so two dwelling units, okay. that's it. Perfect, that's yes. the answer. Yes. We're good now. So if we say <laughs> 2007 to 2009 Eastern Avenue has how many dwelling units? What's your two. answer going to be? <laughs> two. Dose. Okay. Dose. Two extra units. If I ask tomorrow, what's it going to be? Two. <laughs> okay. Noted. All right. All right, then. Um, any done. questions for the board? I do, Mr. Chairman. The does this property currently have half of a third edition already built? Construction was started with, and then uh, made no the permits. Stop. Correct. Correct. Yes. Is there a reason why you tried to build an entire third edition to a row house and didn't think that a permit would be required? Honestly, it was it was a mistake on management. Um, it was it was an honest mistake because it's a big third edition wrapped in green plexi just blowing in the wind right now right Absolutely. and so it's been held up for months because of this process uh, I wouldn't say months but okay. about three weeks you said it was the fault of management yes who's management uh, mine and the contractors and you so had said that fault. sure sure uh, and you had said that the prior so I mean I'm looking at the building and it looks like essentially two residential mm -hmm. uses, yes. right? Uh, it, its last authorized use was as residential or as something else? I, I think residential, but it, at one point what I was told is it was converted into one unit. I, I'm not exactly sure. I th okay. It's in a residential zone. Really. Because converting a single family to a multifamily in an R8 requires a city council ordinance. Okay. Which is why digging into this is becoming a problem, sure. given the history and the fact that, you know, um, okay. The records the planning department had access to suggested that this property was last authorized for use as a retail goods establishment and offices and had previously been used as a funeral home. But you are correct. The original construction of the property was, prior to consolidation, two separate dwelling units. This was a funeral home? And that's what I'm having trouble figuring out. Because if okay. you look at the building, it looks like any old Baltimore row home, right? It doesn't have any of the hallmarks of a funeral home or anything else. And it's a rather narrow structure. So I'm not really sure how you could even make that into a funeral home. <laughs> it doesn't, I didn't buy it looking like a funeral home. I can tell you that. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice building, which is why, again, I'm trying to figure out how right. past non-residential uses would have been in this structure. So, so there are two doors, because there's two buildings, right? So there's yes, two doors looking at the Is there a wall in between? I was gonna ask. Or uh, is it open space? So at this point, it's open. It's open right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you go in two doors, but when you go in, you can walk through. There's, yeah. Yeah. So are the plans to put that wall, put a wall between the two units? Yes, sir. Um, each unit would have three stories? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Any further questions from the board? Any additional confusion from the board? <laughs> and uh, I apologize for that initial confusion. All right, Mr. Plevy, thank you for your presentation, sir. One second. Absolutely.
Okay, uh, moving on the docket, we're going to next call the case of 2019-179, 4909 Hamilton Avenue. Uh, Nate Prettle. Alexander. I got a letter for Alexander Hamilton. Or Mr. Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Afternoon, Mr. Good evening, or Prettle Barry. <laughs> uh, this is a request to construct a three-story multifamily dwelling units containing a Total of 42 dwelling units. Is that correct, Mr. Barry? That's correct. Oh, wrong side. Uh, anyone who's here for the opposition to 4909 Hamilton Avenue, uh, you for step forward. And before we get started and before we even swear you in, I believe we've spoken with the parties regarding some time limitations with regard to the presentation. That's correct. Okay. And so we're all agreeable to that very well. Mr. Chairman, I did not get a chance to speak with the opposition because I didn't know who they were. Oh, sure. um, but the, the, the board can certainly um, advise, them. advise them on the time All right. recommendation for the time limit. Okay, we had proposed uh, folks to the applicant uh, a time limit of approximately 20 minutes on their presentation. Uh, typically, how we how we do this, the applicant goes, then the opposition has the opportunity, and the applicant gets the final word. So we would uh, seek to pose that same 20 minute limitation and, and it doesn't just apply to your case but other cases that are like yours with lots of opposition um, to help us streamline uh, we, we, we have a sense of what some of the issues are and we're cognizant of we'd like you to you know to not repeat <coughs> certain of the, of the issues and we're asking the applicant not to do that as well you want to take a minute to figure out who amongst you wants to speak since you have 20 minutes or what your strategy is so that you can use your time effectively yeah. <laughs> okay I'm the president of the Sedonia Community Association. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, I am the president of Frankfurt where Sedonia is in Okay. okay. And it has bearings what happens in Sedonia. Well, you two ladies may want to speak to make sure that you are each able to get out as <coughs> whatever you would like the board to hear within the 20 minute confines. I'm sure we won't be taking. All right. <laughs> okay. You're saying I certainly hope I like, not. Right. I like that. Good attitude. Okay, great. Is anybody right. here by the name of Peter Gaffey? Uh, Peter Gaffey? Uh, there was one of the two. One of the two. Uh, the vice president. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and swear these parties. And, and just be mindful that look, only one person can speak at a time because it's all being recorded. And uh, once we get into the flow of things, we tend to muddle it sometimes, and we do it too, so we're, we're going to be cognizant to not do that. All right, everybody raise your right hands, please. Oh. Sorry. Give me a second. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, and do we have any staff reports for 2019-179, 4909 Hamilton Avenue? Well, we have a forwarded email in the file uh, that apparently comes by way of a Facebook post hmm. by uh, 
a person by the name of Akita Gopi, who is a resident of S the Sedonia neighborhood, says, we don't want, want this uh, in our community. We'll only bring down our already low property values. It's a rental complex, so there's no property. There'll be no property tax to help the community schools or resources. We will only invite people who are not invested in our neighborhood because when the market rate of rental income, they will not stay long. They will not stay long term as as homeowners do in our community. Several residents do not want this to happen. It will not attract families who want to build in our neighborhood. We already have three to four large rental properties right in that area. Please do not have a lot of Please, we do not have a lot of green space left in our neighborhood, and that would take away uh, from us. We love our community, but this complex will not enhance our community. It will only bring it down. Planning Department reviewed the original application for this property, uh, which uh, was commented on by the department on June the 12th of this year prior to the first hearing of this uh, appeal, which was postponed at, at uh, that hearing date of June 18th of 2019. The department noted that the proposed stacked townhouse style dwelling units would be constructed in three buildings and one each of those buildings facing Hamilton Avenue, Bucknell Road and Arizona Avenue, which were the three streets that formed three sides of this property. The lot area was not sufficient for the number of dwelling units proposed and therefore a variance of approximately 19 percent of lot area was, re was being requested at that time. The application at that time was for three-story rear loading garage stacked townhouses. The applicant postponed, spent time meeting with the community and provided a revised drawing and site plan to the planning department in August and at that time the alternate proposal or amended proposal was for two-story stacked townhouse style units, the same number of units but with no rear loading garage any longer but instead an interior parking court with a parking space assigned to each of the dwelling units and with additional parking spaces provided for visitors. The concern of the department is that the architectural plan as well as the site plan combined to create only one entrance for the upper level of the stacked townhouses and that entrance was, was only going to be from the rear of the properties. In other words, directly from the parking court that was interior to the property. This was of concern to the department because from the perspective of crime prevention through environmental design, this basically consigned 21 residents to coming and going in an area that would not be visible from the street, would not be visible to observation by the police, and in addition would require any visitors to walk through uh, the driveways and the parking lots in order to reach the what would then become the front doors to the upper units. And the department felt that in reviewing the two alternate designs for this proposal, that the first proposal was actually the better choice because it provided the upper units with both a front door on the street and a rear entrance from the parking lot. The department notes that the applicant has the ability to redesign the two-story units to provide both a, fr a front and a rear entrance to both upper and lower levels. However, that design has not been made available to the, par to the planning department at this point. The department is recommending that approval of this application, if granted, be subject to the condition that all construction, improvements, and landscaping are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. The department considers the first version of this application, which was three-level garage stacked townhouse style apartments with rear-loading garages, preferable to the second version with two-level stacked townhouse style apartments arrayed around an inner parking court, but recognizes that the variances requested are essentially the same for each version. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, uh, Mr. Barry, having heard from planning, should the board be favorably disposed towards your application? Uh, would those conditions, features be acceptable to your client? That's a complicated question from the standpoint of uh, they're recommending uh, going back to a design which 
we've modified in response to the neighborhood. And I think you'll see that the design is more in context with the neighborhood uh, in terms of the height. In other words, they're asking us to build a contemporary three-story building. We want to build a more traditional two-story building without a garage. So um, I'll let, uh, we'll get to that in a second. I will say that Mr. French and I spoke about these conditions yesterday afternoon. His email was not working, so I just had a, he could not share with me anything in writing and still can't because it's not been signed by the director. I will say, though, that during this uh, past few days, we were aware of their concern about the entrance situation. And the architect, and we have plans that we'll present to the board and the community and the planning department that show that there will be a front entrance to the street uh, for both units uh, as planning has requested. There's also a rear entrance, uh, but, but there will be a front entrance. So we've been able to manipulate the stairs in a way that meets their, which I think is their primary design concern, at least I, as I understood it. Okay. So with that, and I'll try to, uh, I'll try to uh, stay to our time frame. Um, this is a project. First of all, let me introduce uh, uh, Kathy Jennings, who's the owner developer of the project. She has an extensive history in Baltimore. Her company has completed 20 row houses in, for sale in EBDI, over 200 rental units renovated for housing. Uh, she's uh, with me to my right, uh, Marty Marin, who's the architect. Um, who has been working with a developer. I think it's important for, and I'll try not to belabor the history, but just so you understand the contact, context and iteration with the neighborhoods, is that this started out when Ms. Jennings uh, basically was buying the property under the old zoning code that was anticipated to be developed for elderly housing. We had several el four-story elderly buildings, anywhere from 72 to 92 units. And that was a building that was going to be a one freestanding building on the middle of a two-acre lot. Um, I'll just share this as the only copy I think I have for the board. But that was what we originally discussed with the neighborhood. Unfortunately, in the intervening time, Transform Baltimore happened. And for whatever reason, the zoning that stayed the same for this property did not allow elderly housing to be built at the same density as the previous zoning code. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, just parenthetically, but we couldn't do it. We'd have to rezone the property uh, to a higher density, basically. Um, we then looked at uh, a plan to build these same units, two-story townhouse units. They're not done com too much in Baltimore. They were done at one time. And Mr. Marin, if I can just show you. This was a, the property is somewhat unique and it's two acres. It has three street frontages, which led to the postponement of the previous hearing because we didn't have enough signs. We had two signs, but not three. But this was a design that was presented to the neighborhood and planning uh, back at the beginning of the year. And planning suggested that from an urban design neighborhood context, we really should have the houses face the street rather than each other. So we had, so this was the second design. We had the first design, only houses, the second design. The third design, then uh, again, responding to planning to create an urban edge, which had uh, houses uh, facing the streets. These are sort of an angle to match some of the angles that happened in the neighborhood. And you can see, uh, oh, and the, the, the third, Okay, so these were, the, these were a three-story design, rear-loaded garages. Uh, some of the neighborhood comments said it looks like you might see those in Canton, but maybe not in Northeast Baltimore, Sedonia. Uh, very contemporary. I'll say planning can speak for themselves, but my impression was that they liked this contemporary look, uh, but the neighborhood asked us to look at something a little bit more traditional, which is what we did. We can compare it. Um, so in taking away the garage, in taking away the garage, keeping the streets facing, uh, we then had, you can see, we, we, go to, we moved from a flat roof to a two-story pitched roof. 
and this is uh, these are a representation of the uh, uh, neighborhood immediate streets. So, um, so it's been a long history. We've had half a dozen meetings with both Frankfurt and Sedonia. They've been very pleasant meetings. Uh, we've uh, tried to address issues such as stormwater management, that the overall neighborhood has had some concerns about traffic. We applied to the Department of Transportation to see whether we needed a traffic mitigation plan. They said we did not need one. Um, that was uh, um, uh, helpful for us, but we did pledge to the neighborhood that the stormwater requirements of the city are rather vigorous, and so we would need to contain all the water that's on the site, even though it's a field. Now, there is some runoff, apparently, that happens, and we would be controlling that where it's not controlled today. So that brings us to uh, some of the opposition and our reasons for why we think the board uh, can and should approve this. Um, from the beginning, and we've, the, the relationship with the neighborhoods have been cordial, there was an antipathy toward rental housing. And, and how they present that today um, you know, will be up to them. But it was clear that while the design was getting better, the number of units was, uh, as a rental project, excessive. So we're here for three variances today. I, th I would consider them minor. Two of the variants concern setbacks that reduce the setback is in your staff report from, I think, um, in either one foot or two feet. So it's really a de minimis setback variance. The larger variance has to do with density. Uh, the property is zoned by right for multifamily for 34 units. There's a 2,500 square foot uh, requirement per unit. We're asking that to be reduced to essentially 2,000 square feet. So as Mr. French indicated, it's only a 19% reduction. Now why is that important? I'll get to the reasons. Um, we believe that planning made the right suggestion to go from the earlier plan of the inward facing units to a, 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 a project which really mirrors the neighborhood. Uh, and that were we to then have to take away units by taking away buildings, you would frankly reduce that scale, that neighborhood presence, streetscape, so to speak. So um, I would ask the board, and I'll give you copies of this uh, for your files, that the, our application meets the uniqueness from several standpoints for the variance requirement. The first is the property itself. It's unusual to have a property, even as large as this property, have three street frontages that the designer architect has to contend with. Planning, of course, recognized that by recommending that the entrances to the buildings also face the street, and we've done that. We've redesigned the interior to do that. Um, we cannot go to back to the, we don't want to go back to the three-story. We think that you can compare it to yourself we think this is a much more contextual uh, plan. Even though the neighbor doesn't like the apartments, they would rather us do for, for sale housing. Uh, again, the property was, was purchased back before Transform when it was anticipated to be between 70 and 90 units of apartments. The new zoning code doesn't allow this. We're asking for a slight variance to allow this project to uh, fill out the street. Um, we would have to take away four row homes. The reduction would interfere with the design objectives, objectives, as I said, recommended by planning. Um, the last thing I want to share with you, several things, actually. Um, Mr. Barry, yes. uh, the original application has this as multifamily for three stories. So are you um, amending that down to two stories for the purposes of today? Yeah. Good. Um, this is a, uh, we'll pass these around. The area is in a mixed area in terms of zoning. While the property is zoned R5, you can see it's directly across the street from townhouses or at a higher density uh, in R6. I point that out to the board. This is uh, net. Also, I would point out to the board that this is the Sedonia neighborhood and the Frankfurt neighborhood 
It's a great neighborhood. We've done work with them before. Um, it is a mixed neighborhood which has large apartment complexes. The last thing I pointed, I gave to you was a uh, Google map showing a number of garden apartments with the numbers of those apartments in the immediate vicinity. So this is not something that is uh, apartments in and of themselves are unusual in the middle of a single family neighborhood. This is, this is a, a neighborhood which features both. We think that uh, market rate townhouse units as distinguished from the garden apartments that have been built throughout this area uh, represent a um, substantial private investment. You're not asking for any city funding for this. The uh, developer has experience and um, believes that the neighborhood um, uh, deserves some new rental housing. And we'd ask the board to uh, consider, these are my, let's see. These are my uh, summary of the arguments I just made earlier. And we'll ask, answer any questions as well as uh, try to address any questions that the neighborhood brings up. Okay, thank you. Here is, by the way, I'll, I'll pass these out too. These are, these are the uh, what you're seeing here, as well as the floor plans that have been modified at planning's request. Marty, do you want to add anything as the architect? Or? No, I do. I mean, we've been through. Uh, what's your name, sir? Marty Marin, Mr. Marin Architect. M A R R E N. M A R R E N. Uh, just that we've been through not four iterations, but. <laughs> like 12 iterations because we did four of the senior housing uh, and we've done done many and the last word we got from planning was they would support this if we had the entrances off the street and so we've reversed the plans of, of the houses so that uh, both units enter off the street mm -hmm. and um, all the parking is is interior to uh, uh, the property we're trying to keep the parking from the street that was one reason we had it reversed. Um, but uh, I, I think we've been responsive to the community. Okay. Very well. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Uh, let's hear from the opposition. Ma'am, can we start with you? Well, yes. And I'm just going to ask a couple of things. There were some things said that I was not aware of. Oh, oh, you want to yourself first, please? I'm Winnet Downer. I'm the president of the Sedonia Community Association. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so, I'm going to ask your pardon as a board, but I'm going to read my thing because my, my statement, only because things were said that I wasn't aware of, and well, therefore sure. I would not have inserted this. So there will be some repetition. All right, so basically. Um, ma'am, real quick, um, and just for the benefit uh, of everyone here, I, I just wanted to do a very quick primer on this. Um, things like design, the board has no authority over. Okay, so if it's the look, the aesthetics of the building, unfortunately this board has no jurisdiction to either approve or disapprove that. Uh, secondly, um, the, the city code doesn't distinguish between rental properties and home ownership properties. So again, this board has no authority to approve an apartment versus a single family dwelling. Um, the use uh, is what we're, we're actually um, um, we're here for density but so uh, a lot of the letters we received um, and a lot of the commentary I've heard was about you know we want single-family homeowner occupied properties which I can understand but again this board doesn't just doesn't have the authority to require that uh, of any property owner so you're, you're absolutely welcome to testify uh, here today um, as are everyone else but unfortunately things like the design of the buildings we don't have authority over and again we don't have authority over whether a property is owned or rented. So with those caveats, you're welcome to Thanks testify. for the explanation. Sure. So I, I don't think I'm, my statement has anything to do with the design or any of that. Um, so good afternoon to the planning board and all others involved in this hearing. I'm Wynette Downer, president of Sedonia Community Association, representing the position of res residents who live within these boundaries. Sedonia Avenue going north with the Avenue Northeast um, 
Hamilton Avenue going to the west and Moore's Run Drive down to Radicky. And I want to say that because on some map, some place in the city, Sidonia is huge, uh, much bigger than that, but we're representing the um, residents within that boundary, those boundaries. Um, we are a neighborhood with about 798 homes. 90% of them are owner occupied. We're bordered by apartment complexes. Um, Sidonia is on the outermost reach of Baltimore City Northeast Corridor. On average, most homeowners have lived in the community for about 20 plus years and have reinvested in their homes and environment. The community also has only one public facility, which is Hazelwood Elementary Middle School. There are no libraries, there are no rec centers or anything like that. In November, Mr. Berry approached, well, called me and said he wanted to talk about a project with, through Windham Place LLC. Um, and it was the proposal of a multi-dwelling apartment project to be constructed at 4909 Hamilton Avenue. The original project, he explained to us, was that it was gonna be 21 buildings, 42, three and four bedroom units in three-story stack style building with two car garages per building, Repe repetition. Over the course of the next few months, this and several board and general neighborhood meetings, the developer group reconfigured the style of the building's parking space and parking space per unit. Per basic calculations, at minimum, we're looking at 160 people, at minimum, and 84 new automobiles within that space. Um, I personally, within, with, and the land will be 1.94 acres. So it will abut or be adjacent to homeowners uh, on the back side where there's no street name. Um, I've personally interviewed the surrounding homeowners and some may be here today. They have all voiced concern about the impact of the proposed project on the quality of life to include the congestion, the density, the human congestion, the accompanying garbage and vermin, traffic density, and the accompanying mirrored issues in climate change and existing concerns about underground springs. The homeowners share this, the same concerns that the community at large, those who attended all the meetings. Um, so there's this consistency with the concerns, not the design. We had the design issue and they heard us and, and changed the height of the structures. Um, as I said here, they heard the concerns as a resident and made some significant changes to the initial design. Um, I'm unsure about the, the unique quality of what's being built because it, there's nothing on the site now. So from the perspective of the community, um, after we've discussed it, there's nothing there that, that we can see that makes it a unique site where we have to have the setbacks. Um, where there has to be this high density. Um, I want to insert here that Ms. Ms. Jennings and I, at Ms. Jennings, Mr. Barry and I met yesterday because at one of our meetings, they, they agreed to look at, for, for the sense of good faith, um, assisting or supporting our public facility with the building of a, um, uh, playground for our younger students. So I say that to say that the, the relationship has been amicable, at, at least from my, my perspective. Nevertheless, um, now I have to find my space, so give me a second. When all is said and done, if the multi dwelling project goes forward, Sedonia residents agreed to the unit per square footage calculations based on the numbers um, of, I believe, 185,000 square footage is the, pro the lot size and the 2,500 square foot per unit. Now, I don't understand how you all came up with the 2,500 um, square foot per unit number, but we want this to be reduced to 34 units. We want the, the based on the, the parameters that we're given, what, that we see, that it's reduced to 34 units because of the congestion. We live there. We know what the um, traffic looks like. As a matter of fact, as of today, we have um, 
18 wheelers running down Bucknell Road while they're working on Sidonia. We have been told by residents who live on, whose, whose housing face Hamilton, that there is high traffic density, huge um, um, automobiles running through, children walking on those streets. So we're going to have more children. We're going to have more bodies. What we have now is inadequate parking space, though it can be uh, questionable for some people whether or not the streets are full all the time. They don't have to be full all the time. But when we get new people, and I'm not sure if we have adequate parking space. At this point, I don't know what this new reiteration, if we have adequate parking space for what we expect to be two and three family home, uh, three auto per family homes or you know, apartment dwellers. Um, we see that as congestion. We see that as impacting our community. We see that as impacting the way of life that we have in Sedonia as it is, and I can speak to this as it's happening, as if it was happening to me, we're dealing with a lot of crime issues right now and we don't want to invite through trash and any of the other things that a number of people coming into one area on a small plot of land will, will, will uh, bring. We don't want to invite any more disruptions to the, the life that we're trying to um, build and sustain in, in Sidonia. Um, so, my last statement is, Sidonia does not support 42 units requiring variances to fit the maximum number of units on the plot of land. Sedona Community Association Incorporated is requesting that the BMZA find it in the community's favor, denial of the requested variances for the new construction, and instead consider what is in within the parameters of the Baltimore Planning Department. Uh, I will speak on. <coughs> I will Your name, speak on. Your name, Your name. Thank you. Oh, my name. Oh, I'm going to tell you. I'm Barbara Jackson. Thank you. It's for the Burkert so that we can. Okay, know. very good. Now, I've been in the area since 1973, and thank you. I mean, Mr. Cunningham knows about this. Mm -hmm. And I look out for the entire community and have been involved with the building of houses since the 70s, uh, which was uh, Frankfurt Estates, and we also had demolitions occur because all of us work as a total unit in the community, which is incorporated, Frankfurt is incorporated, which also measures two and one half square miles. I'm sure some people probably may know that. But um, uh, Sedonia is one of our uh, very, very good communities and I'm most happy and pleased to have a president who can lead that area because that area with 26,000 residents is too big for just one person in today's fashion. And that's how many we have totally in the Frankfurt Incorporated community. It uh, all comes to get together with um, Frankfurt Avenue, Sinclair Lane, Moravia, and uh, 40 East. And we also have, uh, I'm giving you an idea of our area, of uh, Moravia Park Industrial Park, as well as Holland Ridge. We also were very instrumental in making sure Holland Ridge changed and go away the way it was some time ago. So I can speak as the person who has gotten all of the information or much information from those who are, are fixed and close to this particular area. I will have to say to you, I hate to say this, but the rest of the folk in Frankfurt are the ones that didn't want any, well, when I said most of the homeowners, they do not want any apartment buildings. But most of us who have worked with many people and know that things are changing too would say, uh, maybe we'll look at this differently because we have approximately 40% of Frankfurt's uh, area happens to be about uh, apartment buildings with regional management and the Kenilworth apartments and others that we have back over in Hazelwood section of Frankfurt, which uh, joins with the Sedonia group of apartment, I mean, uh, homes. So uh, I am very much concerned that they know nothing about all of this new one or the changes because the time they came to Frankfurt 
was twice, once at a board meeting and another one for a general meeting. And the ones at the general meetings pulled out a complete no-go. And if they understood this, because see, I would have a revolt in there if I go back and tell them that I have accepted something that they haven't seen. So I need to make this clear to you. This is gonna have to be shown to them or you're gonna be living with a lot of confusion and hostility from the other parts, which includes that area from Bel Air Road all the way back to Sedonia. Let me interject here for one second. Mr. Berry, can you tell me when, the la when that last change was made to the design that you're now proposing? How long have we been living with that particular design? Um, there were the first iterate. Well, the first iteration of the change from this plan to the, the one on the back took place on, in April. Okay. And then a month or so after that, we decided to go from the three story to the two story. I can't day. remember whether our meeting with uh, Frankfurt had the two story. It was in May. So you would have seen the two story essentially by then. Okay. I can't remember if it was a board or general meeting. That's fine. That, that answers my but, question. But I, I will say since then, uh, our discussions have been predominantly with the Sedonia Association and uh, Ms. Downer's group. Very well. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. I still get my time. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. On me. Go ahead. Well, that's one of the points that I wanted to make, and we want to keep things unified as far as understanding of working cooperatively in Frankfurt, as we did when we built Frankfurt Estates. We had over 300 people who came to City Hall when we were doing that. And um, I don't know whether we have that many coming now because young folks are not as active, and I being the president at the time, I think this gentleman was president at the time. This is Mr. Lauder. He's the vice president. Uh, and he probably could speak that part about uh, how we had to work together. Very much consistent. But I'm glad to have one person. Well, well, I have three. There is Parkside, Gardenville, uh, I guess they call it Gardenville, uh, uh, Association neighborhoods, Mr. Moody and Ms. Downer. Yes. We're aware of the cooperation. Yes. Going on. We really want to focus on uh, on this you, here. We want to focus on what your opposition. Right. Is. My opposition right now is I can't take that stand if I, they haven't seen this. Okay. Tell us what else. It, 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 you, you're, you're contending that your group and your mm -hmm. that you represent mm -hmm. uh, maybe not aware. Of they aren't of aware of those that change, the last change that was given. Okay, the last change. Mm -hmm. Understood. What else is the is, is the concern, or which under? Oh, your they office? have a lot of concerns about the area because they want to know about the trees. So to say, trees are amazing environmental machines, cleaner air that they, they would be uh, taken off of that property, uh, and it has to deal with our drinking water and control of flooding. The problem with the flooding is much of our area, everyone has sunk pumps or wells because there is an underground spring problem. It needs, uh, our city uh, somehow or another, they haven't elected or haven't had the monies to really do a thorough investigation with that. And we saw this when we were having Frankfurt Estates developed and we had total all new infrastructure in that whole section for the development of that corridor of Frankfurt. And we needed it because one, you had that uh, problem of the underground springs and Moore's Run. Two, we have the, um, the, the area where they're talking about is an uh, elevated area, which means that, and it also at one time had a well there on that elevated area. There are lots of trees and things there that we had ran into with Mrs. Uh, Clark with, uh, West, who is one of the local persons who is nearby and worked directly with a lot of the uh, uh, environmental issues 
that uh, forestry for cleaner air and for the drinking water and also that was one. And three, it's the traffic problem. We are right up there at 95 in Moravia, as you probably know, and we are in flux with heavy traffic problems now. And therefore, they see an another apartment building as almost a curse, to be honest with you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Raymond, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, My name is uh, Raymond Lauder, and I thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today <coughs> about this development. Uh, my issue is always traffic. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm totally blind, so I have a lot of issues with traffic. When the traffic department says they don't need to do any studies, I've been trying to get them to do studies in certain places like Sinclair and Frankfurt Avenue, Sinclair and Moravia, Sinclair and Blair Road for uh, 30 some odd years. And we've had some people killed there on those places. I was hit twice uh, in that area. So um, that would be my opposition. Adding more cars and more density would be, to a lot of people with disabilities, a danger. Okay. That's, that's how I feel about that. Thank you, sir, for your input. And just a note about time, there are 90 seconds left on the clock. I'll talk fast. Thank you all for hearing us. Um, I just wanted to address the whole, th yes, my name is Joanne Webb, I'm on Arizona. So when I walk out my door, I'll be looking at an apartment building. That's not a sight, that's not a pleasant sight. The thing too is we talked about a playground. Playgrounds, basketball courts are breeding grounds for crimes if they're not monitored. So I don't think that's a, a, a solution. I could see a recreational center, a facility that is managed by adults where children maybe can come after school, you know, um, have some sort of after school program, but just a playground to me is, it is not sufficient. Also, the traffic at that intersection of Buck Bucknell and Arizona is a brief, I, I'm surprised there haven't been more accidents there because there's only a two-way stop. Bucknell, there's no stop signs, you just keep going. The other thing is um, you always, you know, what about our property values? The homeowners, apartment building, right smack dab in the middle of, uh, you know, townhomes. I guarantee you not one of you, not one of you investors would want that in your community. So I'm not sure why you would find it acceptable in ours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Have we have, okay, very well. Very well. Uh, Mr. Berry, uh, the final word, sir. I'll try to be brief, um, and I, um, I respect the, uh, particularly Ms. Downer, Ms. Jackson, Mr. Louder, who I've worked with for many years in that neighborhood, and they work hard, and they have, uh, we tried to meet them and, and still meet them in good faith. Uh, it was suggested that uh, the Hamilton, the Hazelton uh, um, Elementary School playground need to be upgraded, so we talked to the community about that. I'm sorry, some. That was a response to a suggestion made to you. Right, right. that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry somebody doesn't feel that that school uh, might need that playground as opposed to something else, but that's her position. Um, of the issues that came up, I, I will say that density has been described as these are uh, apartments that might have as many as three cars each and three or four people each. There, these aren't going to be, I, I mean, in my opinion, uh, going to be lead to that density. I mean, you're taking the maximum amount of people you might have, many of which might be children, frankly, going to the elementary school rather than adults. Again, these are market rate apartments uh, that we think they uh, are distinguish themselves from the garden apartments, which are throughout the area, as I've shown you. Uh, we have uh, more than adequate parking that meets the zoning requirement, and I ask for a variance for that. And frankly, from our own observation, the streets of Arizona, Hamilton, and Bucknell, particularly uh, Bucknell, which is across from the church, and have no houses there, is that there are there are parking spaces day or night, as we've been through that to survey. 
So we don't think parking is going to be an issue. One reason is the architect said we put the emphasis on the rear access was to keep cars in the back parking lot. Now they're going to be entering the street, and there's going to be more parking, frankly, on the street. But we think the streets are adequate to handle it. I can't speak to DOT, and they're deciding not to have a traffic mitigation study for this. I will say that comparing Sinclair Lane and some of the other Moravia roads to these streets, which are residential streets, is really not a fair comparison. Those are major arterials leading to I-95, and um, Mr. Louders, you know, uh, should be concerned about traffic on those streets, but not here. Um, as to the underground water that was brought up, we did soil borings to see. That we do know that area because the moors run and here, and there are a lot of tributaries that go underground, and we, we're not uh, digging this. These are going to be slab, uh, built on slabs. We did borings. We could not find any evidence of underground water, so we don't think that's an issue. As I've explained to the community, the stormwater management should actually improve runoff because we're required to keep, required to keep it all on site. And we're not, it's not happening today. It's, it, the grounds get saturated, it runs over, goes downhill. This is, sits up high in the neighborhood, uh, frankly. So with that, I, I've given you our arguments why we think it meets the variance standard. Appreciate your time, appreciate working with the neighborhood, which we will continue to do, and hopefully the board will approve uh, the two minor variances for setbacks as well as the minor 19 percent increase in density so we can complete the neighborhood in, uh, as planning recommended. Very well. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, finally we're going to call the case of 2019-165, 6309 York Road, Richardson Engineering, LLC, to construct fast food restaurant with drive through And I think we're going to be subject to similar time constraints that have been discussed with the parties. Uh, so if the parties could approach. Hi, good Thank afternoon. Thank you all for your patience. Good Save the best for last, right? Hey, there you go. <laughs> Swear the, swear the Raise party. your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. And do we have staff reports for 2019-165? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I would call your attention to this stack <laughs> that is, at last count, 158 letters in opposition. I should be finished reading by about 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> We will defer the reading out loud for now. <laughs> um, I will read uh, a couple of these into the record and say that uh, predominantly they all share the same concerns. Very well, thank you. The first letter, however, is from uh, the Lake Walker Community Association. It says to the board, the Lake Walker Community Association strongly opposes the current proposal to construct a Burger King at um, Annesley, Annesley Shopping Center, excuse me. We're particularly opposed to the conditional use approval of a drive through at the proposed site. The community believes it will be a, a harm to the neighborhood for a variety of reasons. The common reason residents oppose the Burger King is traffic concerns on and around Walker Avenue, particularly due to the proposal of a drive through The association recently, recently conducted a survey of households in Lake Walker pertaining to the issue of the 251 households which were which are active members of the association. We received responses from 85, which is a response rate of just under 40%. The survey asked residents whether they would be in favor of the proposal and what specific concerns they might have. 80%, 86% of the survey respondents were opposed to the Burger King. Of the respondents' concerns, traffic congestion and access to Walker Avenue was the most common. And there's an appendix uh, to this letter that's part of the record that lists 
several other specific concerns. Residents felt that there would be a significant impediment, impediment to access to Walker Avenue from Lake Walker streets, particularly on Clear Spring Road. In addition, residents felt that cars turning left out of the proposed Burger King would pose a danger to through traffic. Many residents cited the, the recent construction of a Starbucks at 31 York Road in Baltimore County as an example of a terrible traffic problem caused by drive throughs in the area. This particular location is a constant headache to anyone traveling on York Road during business hours. There are a number of other additional, there are another, no, there are a number, easy for me to say, of additional concerns related to the drive through and proposed Burger King more generally. These include a potential increase in litter and foot traffic flowing through the neighborhood, the scent of Burger King's grills impacting on the air quality and in and around Lake Walker, the unhelpful impact of fast food availability on citywide goals for improving public health, especially in an area that is only a half mile from the Baltimore City food priority area. The effect of fast food signage on the attractiveness of Walker Avenue corridor, the noise pollution caused by deliveries and trash pickup or operations so near to households on Walker Avenue. In addition, York Road Partnership stated goals for York Road quarter are not in keeping with the proposal. The York Road Partnership SNAP vision goal, uh, vision one goal 2B opposes significant litter producing businesses and requires the development of a written agreement with a litter producing business. Burger King is likely to significantly increase litter in Walker Avenue, much more so than if it, more, much more so if a drive-through is installed. Nice. We strongly oppose the installation of a drive-through drive so near a vibrant and healthy Baltimore community. We urge the city to enforce its existing laws against drive-throughs, much as it has in the past on, in the shopping center. We remind the board that it denied a Walgreens uh, the right to a drive-through in, in years past, only a few feet from the proposed Burger King. Uh, Okay. Additional letter from Councilman Bill Henry's office, uh, essentially saying that he's writing in support of the Lake Walker Community Association, which strongly opposes the current proposal to construct a Burger King and a shopping center, uh, and his apologies that he would have liked to have been here, but he had a conflict. The York Road Partnership has submitted a letter he said, in regards to this appeal, the York Road Partnership supports the Lake Walker Community Association in its opposition against the zoning variance for a drive through for the proposed Burger King. And then finally, I'll read this uh, letter from an individual uh, that is very much like the bulk of the letters that remain in the file. I'm, I'm in strong opposition to Burger King's request for conditional use to allow drive through at their proposed new site on Walker Avenue in the shopping center. I'm a resident in the adjacent neighborhood of Lake Walker. There are many ways that the proposed drive through will negatively impact the safety and quality of life in the surrounding communities. A drive through would, one, severely reduce traffic and redu uh, reduce traffic pedestrian safety on Walker Avenue, a winding hilly, hilly residential street with four sight, sight lines in both directions for proposed drive through entrance and exit. It would push even more shopping center parking onto Walker Avenue and adjacent residential streets by causing a net loss of 54 parking spaces in the shopping center. It would greatly increase traffic volumes. It would extend and draw traffic into nighttime hours. It would increase truck, heavy truck traffic on the residential street. It would create light and sound pollution that would harm surrounding residences. It would reduce property values of adjacent homes. It would harm pedestrian safety on Walker Avenue and at the intersection of York Road and Walker Avenue. A thousand pedestrians use this uh, area on a daily basis, da basis, including elderly and disabled individuals. The danger to pedestrians will be exacerbated by drive through School children will also be in danger when crossing the street at the school bus adjacent to the proposed drive through how can the franchisees desire to in insert an unsafe drive through in an inappropriate place outweigh the wishes of hundreds of taxpaying citizens in the surrounding neighborhoods who strongly oppose granting this conditional use? Okay, planning department reviewed this application. This particular application has been the subject of fairly intense study by the site plan review committee. The Site Plan Review Committee did give review and approval with comments, and final plans in response to those comments were submitted on April 25th of this year. The Department of Planning recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all improvements in landscaping are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Okay, 
Uh, Ms. Hecker, Ms. Fudge Project. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg, on behalf of the applicant. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm here with my colleague, Justin Williams, Gary Edwards, who is the operator of the proposed uh, Burger King, his staff, who also happen to be his children, his family. It's a family enterprise. Uh, we also have Mark Keeley here with us, who is our traffic engineer from Traffic Concepts, and Rick Richardson, who has disappeared behind me, um, who is our civil engineer on this project. Uh, with your permission and in the interest of time, I'd like to proceed by way of a proffer. Everyone is certainly here and able to answer as many questions as you may have for them, um, but it is late in the day and I think things will go a lot more smoothly if we go this way. So I have prepared a uh, packet of exhibits which I'll share with you all. Also. Um, you guys kill a lot of trees. We <laughs> slaughter whole forests for this. In the interest of So just to refresh your recolle recollection, we were here in early July. We had a hearing scheduled July 2nd. Um, when we came th down that day, we discovered that there were a large number of community folks who were here. We decided to postpone that day so we would have the opportunity to meet with them. Councilman Henry coordinated a meeting the following week. We met on July 7th. Um, and we had a, an extensive discussion of the, the project, the operation. I, th I think we were able to answer a lot of their concerns about the, the operation of the restaurant and the operation of the drive through Their major concern, as articulated in many of these, these letters that we heard from uh, Mr. Barb, was traffic. And we understood from them that they had engaged the city to pr uh, prepare a traffic calming study. The city Department of Transportation uh, indicated that they would be able to do that at the end of October. Um, and in the interest of time, we decided that we would engage our own traffic consultant to do a study of, of the Walker Avenue corridor um, in light of the concerns that the community had raised. And um, we'll talk through all of that today. Um, I would like to frame the issues that are before the board today. This is an application for a conditional use approval for the drive-through. The restaurant itself is permitted by right. The property is zoned C3. The only thing we're here for today is the conditional use approval of the drive-through. We're not seeking any variances. And in considering a conditional use application, the use itself is presumptively allowed uh, in the absence of some showing that the inherent adverse effects of the use are somehow worse at this location than they otherwise would be. So um, that's the, the framework in which we will, we will share our, our plans for the site. Mm -hmm. The property is located in the Annesley Shopping Center, uh, which is right at the city county line at, along York Road and Walker Avenue. Um, I've included in the file the first exhibit that you'll see is an aerial photo that shows the property. Um, we can see north is oriented upwards on, on the page as you'll see it. The, pro the piece that we're talking about um, is this portion of the parking lot located along Walker Avenue. Um, in it, the, the city county line is like sort of here-ish. It run the, um, there's a Wells Fargo bank and a Panera that are in the city portion of the property as well as a portion of the party city uh, leased premises in the shopping center. The remainder of the shopping center, which has a mix of retail and uh, restaurant type uses, is located in Baltimore County. In the on the county side, there is also a 161,000 square foot county office building and a parking garage that serves the, the county office building as well as the rest of the shopping center. So the second thing you'll see in the file is the zoning map that shows the portion of the property in the city. Obviously, it cuts off at the city line. North of the, that line is uh, the part of the, the project that's in the county. Um, the shopping center provides a total of 921 parking spaces, 312 of which are located in the parking garage on the site. Uh, under the county zoning regulations, the site is required to provide 676 parking spaces. In the city portion, an additional 18 parking spaces are currently required. This leaves a surplus of 227 parking spaces in the existing shopping center. Uh, we've also included as the third exhibit the overall site plan for the shopping center, which should also give you a better flavor of what the, the whole site looks like. I would also note that York Road is a very heavily trafficked commercial corridor. It is not only a state highway, it is also a Baltimore City truck route. And there's a copy of the truck route map shown um, in exhibit four in the file that you have in front of you. Uh, Mr. Edwards, who is here today, is the franchisee for uh, the proposed Burger King. He has a lot of experience with Burger King. He's been with them since 1978, and I'm going to let him speak briefly when I'm done so he can tell you a little bit about his experience. He has 11 other Burger King locations in the Baltimore area. Um, he has been a franchisee since 1994. Uh, he started from the assistant manager role and has worked his way up. 
Um, he is proposing to create a 27,000 square foot pad site on the shopping center on that por portion of the parking lot that I showed you. Um, the new address will be 6309 and one half York Road because of the uh, weirdness of the, the way the addresses are numbered and we've included a, a, a letter from the property location department identifying this, um, this particular lot uh, within the shopping center just so that we're all clear about which portion of the property we're talking about. Um, Mr. Edwards will also tell us that the, um, generally in the quick service restaurant industry, they do most of their business at the drive-thru. About 60% of their business is done at the drive-thru these days. It's a convenience-oriented type use. Um, they want to get people in and out as quickly and as, as safely and expeditiously as possible. Um, so the drive-thru is an important component of the, of the Burger King. Um, Mr. Richardson, who is here, is our civil engineer on this project. His CV is included as Exhibit 6 in the file. He would testify as an expert um, in civil engineering and site design. Um, his site plan is also included as Exhibit 7, and we have that enlarged. And I'm going to ask maybe Mr. Williams to play Vanna White here and hold this up. Um, what we have here is an enlarged portion of the site plan for the Burger King portion of the property. This is Walker Avenue here. Um, York Road is line up here. The restaurant is oriented towards Walker Avenue and as you can see the, the site access comes in from Walker Avenue and you can also access through the shopping center back here and back here into the drive through lanes. It's a dual drive through which comes through this way on the back of the property so I would note that this is designed intentionally in this fashion so that the drive through queuing lane does not back up onto Walker Avenue like that Starbucks that was mentioned in one of those letters or onto York Road, which is you know further out that way. The drive-through lane circulates around the property here. Um, there's, I think, uh, we have 11 stacking spaces, if I recall correctly. I'll have that in my notes in a second. Um, there are 62 seats inside the restaurant here. Um, and let's see, what else can I tell you about this? That I, may, I may let you put this down for right now. We're not, as I said, we're not asking for any bulk or yard um, or parking requirements. So this is designed to, excuse, excuse me, variances. Um, this is designed to comply with all of the city's requirements. And in fact, the site plan has been reviewed and approved with comments by the site plan review committee, as Mr. French indicated in his, um, in his report. So for the Burger King use itself, there are three parking spaces that are required. It's one per 1,000 square feet of indoor public seating area. We have about a 3,300 square foot uh, restaurant, plus three stack stacking spaces for the drive through lane. We are providing 17 parking spaces within the Burger King pad site and 11 stacking spaces uh, within the drive through lane. Um, in this, this, for the city portion of the shopping center as a whole, this, the new Burger King will require a total of 25 parking spaces for the city portion um, and 12 stacking spaces. And within that area, we are actually providing 75 spaces and, tw and 25 uh, stacking spaces. Uh, we also have a landscape plan that we have prepared as part of this uh, project, which, uh, as you can see on the, the aerial photo, it's all impervious surface right now. It's all just a sea of asphalt. We are reducing the amount of impervious surface from 98% to 84%. This is our landscaping plan here. It's a 14% reduction in impervious area. Uh, we're also installing um, a retaining wall. There's a grade change on this side of the property, and we are installing a four-foot-tall fence on top of the retaining wall to prevent headlights from um, being visible into, you know, lights spilling out into the neighborhood across the street. We are cognizant of the fact that there are residences on this side of the street. Um, we have um, standard signage for the Burger King proposed. Uh, there is a rendering of the proposed, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself in the exhibits. There's a rendering showing the proposed uh, Burger King in the file as well as the landscape plan, which we just talked about. Exhibit 10 is the signage plan, a building elevation. Um, it's standard Burger King signage. It's all designed to comply with the city's new signage re requirements. We're not requesting any signage variances related to this. The proposed hours of operation are Sunday from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., Monday through Thursday, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Friday and Saturday from 6 a.m. to midnight. Uh, so you know, this is not a, a super late night operation. It doesn't stay open all night long. It's certainly not a 24-hour operation. The restaurant is expected to create 35 new full and part-time jobs and represents a capital investment of approximately a million and a half dollars in Baltimore City, all of which is privately funded. Uh, Mr. Keeley, who's also here, is our traffic consultant. He's with Traffic Concepts. His CV is included in the file as Exhibit 11. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, the community had raised in our meeting with them in early July the fact that they have all these concerns about traffic, particularly along Walker Avenue. And they had told us that they had reached out to the city about preparing a traffic study to, to figure out what to do about that. Specifically, they had raised with us the issue of the access point on Walker Avenue and the speed at which people travel along Walker Avenue. And so we spoke to the city's Department of Transportation. They confirmed what the community had told us, which was that we would be, they would be doing their own study, but they wouldn't be able to do it until the end of October. So um, we asked Traffic Concepts to look into these issues and their report is included as Exhibit 12 in the file. Um, as a practical matter, a drive through restaurant is a convenience type use, and, and Mr. Keeley can talk a little bit about this as well. It's designed to pick up trips that are already on the road. It's not intended to be a destination where people get in their car and generate new trips to go there. It's, it's really, their, their target market is people who are already traveling up and down York Road and who are already traveling on Walker Avenue who see the Burger King and decide to pull it off. It's also intended to capture internal, it's called internal capture, um, visitors who are already, customers who are already in the shopping center. They're, they're working in the, the Baltimore County office building, they're visiting the party city or running an errand at the Wells Fargo next door. Um, they're already there in that, in that uh, vicinity to begin with. It's not, again, a destination. This is the type of place where you want to have a drive through restaurant. You don't want it to be out in the middle of nowhere where people have to make it a destination to go there and therefore create a whole bunch of new trips. Um, in any event, the traffic calming study that Traffic Concepts prepared concluded that the access point to the shopping center along Walker Avenue operates well within the industry standards from a capacity perspective. Um, they, there are no um, notable concerns with it, and again, Mr. Keeley can discuss this in, in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, it also noted that the community's perception about speeds along Walker Avenue is correct, that people do tend to speed there, and the posted speed limit is 25 miles an hour. People tend to travel five to eight miles an hour faster than that. The main area where they're, they're picking up speed is further down closer to the Alameda though. It's not really in this particular section of Walker Avenue, but nonetheless, Traffic Concepts recommends in their study that traffic calming measures be installed in coordination with the Baltimore City Department of Transportation. And we're committed to doing that based on the city study, which they're still planning to do. Um, they've asked us to wait to do anything until they've done their study, and we're happy to work with them on that. We have certainly no, no problem with that. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Gary to speak just very briefly about his experience in the Burger King industry, um, and then we'll let Mark speak briefly, and then um, I may have another thing. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. And either, it, probably both or either of you can answer it. One, is it a requirement of Burger King franchisees to have a drive through And two, how many Burger Kings do you own and operate currently that do not have drive throughs I'm going to let Mr. Yeah, Mr. Oh. Yes. I thank you for hearing us today. Um, I'm Gary Edwards, and um, to answer your questions first, um, Burger King does have situations where um, they don't have drive-throughs, but typically they're non-traditional locations, they're malls and that kind of thing. Um, all of my stores have drive-throughs. I do have a couple of um, comparable stores. I have stores that operate in, in shopping centers, and I find them by far and large to be the best locations with drive-throughs because the, the confinement of the shopping center tends to provide for a safer uh, trip. So back at the beginning, um, I've been a Burger King franchisee since 94, um, started back in 78. Uh, I've worked just about at every level of uh, management, and I actually started when I was a kid in high school. I had a couple years as an employee. Um, we are a family-owned business. Um, I, at the end here is Maria, my daughter, my son Alex, and my nephew Anthony. Um, combined the four of us control and operate the stores. We're the ones that are physically there day to day. Um, Anthony, in fact, lives in Timonium, which is a couple miles up the street, and he will be supervising uh, the store that we want to build on uh, Walker Avenue. Um, my experience has taken me to just about every Burger King in the state of Maryland. Uh, worked 
through Baltimore City. Um, if there's a store in Baltimore City, at one time in my career, I've managed it. Um, uh, when I started in 94, uh, we, I actually started by taking um, two Burger Kings that had bankrupted. They uh, went out of business, and that's how I got my start. I leveraged uh, my experience and my reputation with a financial backer, um, and I went and opened, reopened the two stores that had bankrupted. They're now very successful. They outperform the nation uh, significantly. Um, so we're proud of that. Uh, I was a five-store operator for a period of time, um, and I kind of kept the five. Burger King did go through some turbulent areas. Um, their ownership changed hand, hands about six years ago, and they've really worked hard um, to change that fast food connotation, right? I'm sure you, you've all heard about the Impossible Whopper. Um, so we're, we're, we're happy to have done that. We're, we're, we're having good success with it. Um, but the point is, is that I suspended my growth um, at five stores. And then last year we picked up, uh, we actually acquired as the, my partners, they're now partners, it's tough to say that. Um, they, they, um, they expressed an interest in, in the brand and wanted to, to get into the business, so I became partners with them. Um, we we uh, acquired eight stores in August of last year, and we have plans to completely renovate them over the next two years. Um, uh, they, again, it's another uh, story where stores have been run poorly, and uh, we've acquired them in an effort to rebuild and uh, make them successful. We're already seeing really good gains with that. Um, uh, so, and it was eight stores, and we actually closed one because of a lease issue, um, and another because of, uh, actually they were both because of lease, lease issues. So, um, which brings me up to now we're building stores. We've got seven on our plate to build um, uh, Burger King. I, and I say that because in order to do that, Burger King has to rate us as um, a top-level franchise. Um, they will not let just anyone um, develop stores. We, um, we are monitored on a variety of metrics that um, relate mostly to guest service, and we do well in all of those. Um, so we've gotten the green light to, to develop. Um, and uh, we plan to do that. Now, the, the only other thing I'd really like to say at this point is related to the way that, that Burger King will set up on the lot. Um, now Caroline mentioned that that was a, a retaining wall. So that retaining wall is like 10 feet off a of grade, right? So this drive-through, in, in all of my experience, is probably the safest one that I've built in relationship to p pedestrian movement. And the traffic flow, one of the reasons we like this is that unlike the, the Starbucks that was mentioned, it's actually a very good example. It, it's actually a location that I would never build, right? I built this because of the movement on this lot. To me, location is very important but my drive-through movement, it has to be easy to get in and out of. Because just as much as the community doesn't like the Starbucks location, neither do we. Because when we create that kind of situation, people don't like to get in it, right? So the, the, the success of the store is hindered when the drive-through doesn't work right. This is probably the best example that I have. And the best example, not to say it's the best, but it is one of the best that I've experienced in my 40 years of doing this. Um, I, I, think, I think that's about all I have. If there's any questions. So you, yes, yep. sorry. <laughs> no worries. You said you're building seven more Burger Kings. Are they all in Baltimore City? Uh, no. And are any of the other sevens that you plan on building off of two lane streets, like one direction? Well, some of them are just crystal ball. Okay projects right now, right? We, we have, um, trying to think, uh, we have a, a, another shopping center pad on Ritchie Highway. 
uh, directly on Ritchie Highway, right. but it has a it has a cross street comparable to to Walker. Okay. Okay. Instead of it being uh, in front of the stores to the to the right, okay. but it's the same basic situation. Um, and then we it act just that happens to be that we have another one in in Forest Hill, Harford County. Um, kind of same situation. It's going to set up on a pad site at the back of their lot, and there'll be residential right opposite it so yes we do it Here, here's i did forget to just say one other thing from my perspective as carolyn said that we met twice with the community um and i'm a little shocked at the presence against us today because i thought our meetings went well and one of the things we we did for the community is we we heard every issue that they had and we made a commitment to the to the community to address those to to uh, in whatever way was physically possible for us to address. And uh, you know, obviously, with some caveats, I I can't agree to work. For example, I can't shorten my hours from ten in the morning until two in the afternoon. Um, but the commitment to 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 keep our hours, at, as uh, Carolyn indicated. Um, 7 to 11 and 6 to 11, um, you know, we're happy to make those kind of commitments. Uh, noise, we, you know, we deal with that um, in terms of technology, very little noise. Um, we have, um, we've made a commitment uh, from an operating perspective that we um, will respond to any issues. It's kind of like that that movie, any given Sunday, you know, we are not perfect, right? But someone brings an issue to us, we address it. Um, and we are rich with our communities. Whenever anyone raises a hand, need of help, we're there to help. Um, we also do scholarships to local kids in our communities. Um, we are a community player and totally committed family operation, small business. Nice. Mr. Edwards, um why not, lo why, not, why not locate the restaurant on the front parking lot? Why the back one? Uh, I think from my perspective, our brand, once we're, once we're known, that that location is a better position for the drive through You wouldn't want to capture the traffic from York Road as opposed to... Well, I wouldn't Park want to Avenue? be Starbucks. I, I, I wouldn't want to be Starbucks faced with the, the confusion. I don't have their, you, you know, in today's world, I probably don't have their brand recognition. So I know that the better I make that store flow movement wise, that I will capture traffic from York Road. But wouldn't the Annesley Shopping Center match the Giant and the Bust Market and all the Chipotle across the street if you simply added more commercial to the York Road corridor portion of this lot versus the Walker Avenue portion well, that, of the that, that, that's a good question, and from me locally, I, you know, my our offices, um, as I was in the management roles at Burger King, were right there in Towson. We were at 6910 York Road. <laughs> Did you ever try making a left-hand turn out of York Road? Yes. Yeah. So, I, I'm just saying, our our philosophy is that this this setup it is is um, works really well. And I think it's going to be a very good store for us. So I, I'm not sure I would want to be out there. It would all absolutely depend on, on the characteristics of the, the real estate. You know, but if you put me on a, in a crowded section of that, that lot uh, where it's already congested and, uh, and heavy traffic, then I probably wouldn't swap. If, I, if uh, the owners of the center were to come to me tomorrow, and give me a congested place up front, I probably would shy away from that. Okay. Uh, I have a question. It may go back to you, Ms. Hecker. You mentioned that the city is not going to be completing its study until October, or the end of October. Uh, what is the timetable for, or the necess necessary timetable uh, for you to move forward now versus taking a step back and waiting for that traffic study uh, so we can assess, obviously, it's no statement as to your expert, but it is your expert that you hire to uh, render the traffic study. 
Um, we have certain deadlines we have to meet under our lease to know that we have the authority to do the, the drive-through. Um, the real estate deal is, I think, what's driving the, the timing of this. How? Sorry? How is it, how's driving the um, timing? Under the lease, we have to obtain approval to have the drive-through if we're going to proceed. We're not, I mean, we certainly can't start construction um, until we know whether we're going to have the drive-through or not. Um, and we need to, uh, you can jump in and talk more about the lease. I mean, but you couldn't, you you couldn't wait a couple months? Um, part of my commitment to Burger King is to honor an obligation of, of time for the, these units that I develop, and I will be over that time limit if I have to wait. And I, I guess the consideration from my perspective is we had the traffic study done independently, and I paid for that. Um, and based on the outcome of it, um, it didn't seem to me, and again, the, the engineer will speak to this. I'm not sure I'm 100% right here, and he can confirm this or not. But there seems to be a limited amount of trips coming from Walker Avenue to the Burger King. And um, uh, we have agreed to help with the, the traffic calming measures. So I think, at worst, the study that you do in, in the city will confirm that, and we will go ahead and do those, those traffic calming measures. So I, you know, I, I, if there was a reason that I could grasp one too, and I had to take a delay, um, you know, I, I would consider it. I just don't understand why, why that would need to be necessary in light of the circumstances. Would you still open the Burger King if you did not get a drive-through? Uh, I have the option. It needs to be discussed thoroughly with Burger King. They, they would be a driving uh, factor in that. I would certainly not want to. I believe I've given you this, probably one of the safest drive-through operations you can get. Um, so I, 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 I don't, I won't understand if uh, we're not allowed to build with the drive-through. One other thing on the issue about the traffic study that the city's doing. The city's traffic mitigation ordinance requires a traffic impact study if the, the building square footage is 15,000 square feet or greater. Our building is only 3,300 square feet. We're a fifth of the size that we would have to be to trigger a traffic impact nice. study. We're doing it because we're trying to be cooperative with the neighborhood. That's why we engaged our own traffic consultant to do it now. We want to make sure we address their concerns. Um, but it's not this we would not otherwise have to do a traffic study sure. what was the city's commitment to do one given that they're not required to given the size of the building? because the, the community asked them to do it okay. um, they're you know they're trying to be helpful I think and and, I'm, and we want them to be and and as mr. Edwards indicated we're happy to to do the traffic mitigation that is identified by that study whatever it is whether it's speed bumps or something on Walker Avenue um, to address you know, the traffic calming issues. Um, I, you know, the city has asked us to wait for them to do their study before we come up with a plan for what we would do because they want to look at it themselves and, and we're happy to, to let them, um, help, you know, to work with them to figure out what is appropriate there. Okay. And Ms. Hecker, we're about eight minutes over time. The board can certainly give eight minutes back to anyone, uh, to the, uh, the folks um, in opposition, but I think you had um, one more witness, is that correct? Oh, yeah, I would like Mr. Keeley to speak briefly. Real Thank quick. You. Um, Mark Keeley, um, project manager with Traffic Concepts Incorporated. Um, the traffic study we did uh, touches two main points, a speed study along Walker Avenue, and we did a trip generation analysis for the proposed Burger King and an uh, intersection analysis at Walker Avenue at the shop, existing shopping center access point. Um, Walker Avenue is posted at 25 miles an hour. Um, that in itself presents speeding problems for, for most drivers. Um, there were four points along Walker's Avenue that we did the study. Right at the uh, shopping center along Walker's Avenue, the speeds um, were closest to the posted speed limit. The, the 85th percentile speeds in that, at that location were, were 29 to 30 miles an hour. As we got further closer to the Alameda, Alameda um, at the three other points, 
I think the 85th percentile speeds were 35 miles per hour and, and higher. Um, as we said, um, to control the speed to 25 miles an hour, and I, I, I don't know how, the, I think the statutory speed is supposed to be 30 miles an hour and you need a speed study um, to, to get below that speed. I don't, I don't know if that was ever done, but nonetheless, it's 25 miles an hour. So uh, the only way to control speeds would be to have some type of speed control devices, speed humps, or uh, narrowing uh, the roadway with uh, curb lines. Um, the other part of the study was a trip generation analysis. We use the ITE trip generation manual that's standard in the industry throughout the country. Uh, the study that Baltimore City is going to conduct will have that um, manual to determine uh, peak hour trips. So we looked at peak hour trips a.m. during the weekday, a.m., midday, and uh, weekday p.m. Um, we looked at the, uh, the road network and came up with a traffic distribution pattern um, and then assigned the, the new trips to, to the um, study intersections. So we used the highway capacity software to analyze um, Walker Avenue and the shopping center access point. Um, PM peak hour I think was the worst. It's an acceptable sea level service. Um, the AM and midday levels of service what were. What does that sea level service mean? Sea level service is it's um, uh, adequate traffic flow. Um, there are C indicates there are some delays. It's, it's the peak hour so there's going to be uh, some delays for uh, left turn movements at the intersection. Um, typically a level of service D is, is um, or better is, is an acceptable level of service. Um, as it was stated before, uh, a fast food is, is a convenience type use. Um, so the ITE manual has a pass by percentage for fast food of 50 percent and I think that's fairly conservative. So pass by, as was explained before, our trips that are already on the roadway that see the Burger King, they pull off on their way to someplace else, they pull into the Burger King and leave. So um, it would be expected that it, at minimum 50% of the trips would access the site from York Road. So that, that's where your traffic, that's where you're, obviously you're going to be pulling your traffic off. Um, to visit the store, so they would be right in and right out of the site. Um, a new trip is from, let's say it's, it's a home base trip to the Burger King to back home. So those, tr those new trips are going to be much less than the pass-by trips. So um, to, to conclude, the, the report um, says that Baltimore City at some point in time, if they want to maintain the 25 mile an hour posted speed limit, there should be some um, traffic control mitigation discussed and implemented. But in terms of the trip generation for peak hour, it was our finding that the site access points could operate at acceptable levels of service when the store is built out. Did your analysis show whether or not there was um, more traffic traveling eastbound on Walker Avenue or westbound? Um, any particular time. I mean, yeah, I'd have to look at that part of the analysis. I'm, uh, I'm just curious. We captured the peak hour trips <laughs> along Walker Avenue. I um, typically there's um, you know a.m. You're going to have more. It's probably divided the way Walker Avenue is between York Road and the Alameda. Mm -hmm. So some trips, um, I would say a.m. You'd probably have a higher flow towards York Road, but I'd have to look at the data more. Um, closely. And then same question um, but stretched to York Road was any part of your study um, or your analysis done with traffic traveling north on York Road um, versus south on York Road or was that not included because it that, was uh, off of? Yeah that was included we just did a general intersection okay. analysis and then used the uh, HCM software to determine a level of service. What, <clears throat> what percentage of your trips to the Burger King come off of um, Walker? So we had, um, if you're heading, I guess that's um, 
southbound York Road, we had 35% making a right onto Walker and then accessing the site, and that 35% would head back out to York Road. And then from the Alameda, heading down Walker, we had 15% of the traffic that would come into the Walker Shopping Center access and then make a left and head back in that same direction. And the remaining 50% would be from York Road access. Is there any um, concern or um, issue with the, the fact that your study was conducted during the summer months before uh, school went back into session? What if, if you were looking at it after school was in session? Sure. Would anything change? We find that um, traffic counts when conducted in the summer are typically 15, 10 to 15 percent during in peak hour, um, less than you would find when school is in session. But given the level of service, uh, of a C, which is pretty good. Um, uh, w we don't think if the counts would be conducted in October that it would create failing intersection level service. The failing grade is. It's typically a, a D, and it, it's not. Okay, if you get D, then that's well, insufficient. That's not uh, appropriate to maybe move forward. Well, in most jurisdictions, a D is an acceptable level of service. That's I, why I asked, what's a failing grade? <laughs> yeah, failing is E or F. It's yeah. not the same as your school grades. It's, sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a letter that's associated with intersection delay. I mean, it could be one, two, three, four, five, but for some reason well, they I think a significant issue here is intersection delay. Um, a C under this rating scale yeah, C is pretty good. I mean, we're talking, this is peak hour. So we, we count the traffic during the worst traffic conditions. Mm -hmm. So if it's a C level service, that means there's, there's capacity there for traffic. Okay. And with the number of trips that are going to be new trips generated by this Burger King, um, which I understand are not a ton of new trips, would they tip this into a failing category? The existing level of service? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, <laughs> commissioners, my name is Becky Witt, and I am here on behalf of the Lake Walker Community Association, which is opposing this drive through application. Um, and so, in order to not waste any more time. I think I'll just call um, up the first person who's going to testify. Um, there are three people who are going to testify today um, and then have all uh, prepared their own um, testimony that they will give. So, um, Janet, you can go first. And Miss Witt, you do have 35 minutes. 35? So, right. Yeah. So we're, okay. we're doing well. <laughs> can, can you pass out the exhibits? Yes. I'm going to move this microphone down, down, down a little bit. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Janet Abramovitz, and I am a 25-year resident of the Lake Walker community. My husband and I um, live in, have lived Can in, I yes? Just interrupt you for a second. Everyone has stood up to who is in opposition, so I don't want to leave them standing so they can, they can sit down. If you, I need to be including you. Okay. Thank you. Um, my husband and I have lived in uh, Lake Walker for 25 years. Um, Currently, we live on Widener Avenue, just two street, excuse me, two houses in from, from Walker Avenue. And I'm also a past president of the Lake Walker Community Association, and I've been asked by the association uh, at the request of the board to speak on behalf of the organization today. Um, in my testimony, I'm going to focus on two major issues, traffic safety and parking issues. <laughs> We believe that the increased traffic volume and the circulation patterns from the drive-through would pose significant danger and inconvenience to area motorists and pedestrians. And we believe that the plan does not satisfy the criteria of the zoning code um, that all drive-through lanes must be located and designed to ensure that they not adversely affect safety and efficiency of traffic circulation. In fact, traffic problems in the area would be made far worse 
and new problems would be created if a fast food drive through was allowed on Walker Avenue. And I know the address is on of this property is on York Road, but the reality is that this building and the drive through are on Walker Avenue. The problems that would cre be created, it would add an average of about 100 vehicles an hour on Walker Avenue, nearly twice that at peak hours, the added traffic generated and the loss of existing parking will push cut through traffic and parking further into Lake Walker's narrow streets. Burger King's 11 p.m. or midnight closing time would draw traffic into the area in what is, are now normally quiet times. Um, all the other nearby restaurants close at 9 <coughs> or 10 at the absolute latest. And their plan does not mitigate the uh, significant problems it creates. And I, I would like to say that we did have the opportunity to meet with Mr. Edwards and the Burger King team, and we do, the, the community really appreciates the opportunity to have great conversations with him, learn more about their business, learn more about the family, and how they like to run things. And so what I'm about to say now does not discount our appreciation for any of that. Um, we really do appreciate their, their time and effort. Um, and they did listen to our concerns, but the reality is that our main concerns having to do with traffic, having to do with hours, having to do with a lot of the other conditions that we'll talk about that would be generated by this drive-through are not things that he's really in a position to change. Uh, we also did ask him, would you open the Burger King without the drive-through in that location. And at the time he said he had spoken with Burger King and yes, they, they said it would be okay to do that um, and that his business model would allow it. So, um, uh, yes, um, council is going to hand out um, some photos. Uh, I have a set, thank you, yeah. Um, and also we have a photo board to give you a sense of, of this site location because Walker Avenue's topography make it an especially unsuitable location for a drive-through. It is winding and hilly. It's a two-lane residential street. Exiting and entering the neighborhood as well as the shopping center is already dangerous because of very poor sight lines. And um, if you look at the photos, you can see, whoops, I misspoke. I think I gave away my package of photographs. Oh, no, I didn't. Yes, I clipped them to my testimony. Thank heavens for clips. Um, so the, the first photograph is uh, of eastbound Walker Avenue from York Road. And you can see, um, so that's taken about here. The sight line for the sight lines. Isn't the it? Yes, the sight line for the sight line. But on the photo, right there where the, the, uh, the caption is, that is an entrance to Clear Spring Road, which you cannot see coming down York Road. Here is the, the site where the Burger King would be up there. Where is that entrance on the um, larger? On the map, so. So that's where no, the Clear entrance. Spring Road. There's Clear Spring there on, on that yes, Here's Clear Park. Spring. Okay, okay this is, th this was looking down into the curve, right? right? Uh -huh. Is that first picture is taken coming down from there. I'm sorry, can you hear if I step away from the microphone? Okay. The next photo in the package shows the view coming from westbound, coming from here, and the truck is in where the drive-through access would be. So you can see there's a blind rise there where you cannot see you cannot see what's coming up the other side. And the next photo shows essentially a similar thing, but coming from this direction, 
coming from the west, and that car that stopped is essentially, that's what, who would be turning into where the drive-through, the other car is exiting the shopping center, and there's a pedestrian. So the sight lines, particularly right there at that intersection, are extremely poor, and when you combine it with the, the speeding traffic and so forth that was were shown in um, the traffic concept study, it creates a lot of problems. Um, now, I looked at some other traffic data, um, and that's in, <coughs> excuse me, in this packet of uh, figures. The first one shows, this is from uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation, recorded on a weekday in January of 2015. And this is York Road near the Annesley Shopping Center. Weekday traffic is over 28,000 vehicles, mostly between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. The second figure is traffic on Walker Avenue. This is a study that was done by the uh, Maryland SHA in uh, April of 2018. And this shows the eastbound, westbound traffic on that road and the time of day. Um, there are about 5,100 vehicles per weekday, mostly between 7 a.m., 7 p.m., what you'd expect. Traffic drops off sharply after rush hour and is pretty negligible later in the evening and in the overnight hours. Um, likewise, the current traffic that enters and exits from that uh, entrance on Walker, where, uh, which would be the entrance and exit for the Burger King, currently that's fairly light. And mostly it's uh, employees who are coming or going uh, to park at the uh, county office building. Um, and, okay. Um, so the next figure, figure three, shows, contains the trip generation data from uh, the traffic concept study. Um, and that was overlaid on the existing uh, uh, DOT transportation data for Walker Avenue. And what we can see is that for a fast food dress restaurant the size of Burger King, during morning peak hours, it would generate 134 vehicles an hour. And the increases in this chart are in red. That is a 34% increase over existing morning traffic on Walker Avenue. Around noon, there would be an addition of 172 cars, a traffic increase of 73%, and at the evening rush hour, it would generate uh, about a 22% increase. And, and obviously, evening rush hour is the busiest time of day. Clearly, a fast food drive through would increase traffic on Walker Avenue. Um, I mean, it's almost an extra 1,800 cars a day. That's about a 35% increase. And that's an increase that this street and all of its conditions cannot safely accommodate. Um, Burger King, by its very design, will route traffic on to Walker Avenue. In the traffic concept study, it estimated that half of traffic to their site is gonna come down York Road from the north and turn in. 35% would come from this direction and turn onto there. And 15% would come down Walker Avenue from the east. Okay, so 50% would come from Walker Avenue, 50% would come from York Road. Now in the study, they said that the 50% of customers that come from the north on York Road would, and I quote, have no impact on Walker Avenue. 
this, it just defies logic. If this is where the drive-through is, I find it extremely impossible to believe that if you've come from here and you've wound your way through this shopping center, which has, yes, which you would have to do, you'd wind through this shopping center, through all these tight lanes, the parked cars, so forth and so on, the pedestrians, go through the drive-through. Now, if you're here, would you go back through the shopping center and out through there and then go York Road and then come down here or turn up there? No, you turn onto Walker Avenue, go to this light and go in either direction. So what that means is essentially 100%, 50% of the traffic may enter the place from Walker, but 100% is gonna leave by Walker Avenue. And recall those photos that showed how poor the sight lines are. Um, and all these vehicles that exit here and go down to Walker Avenue will cause backups into obscuring that uh, entrance and obscuring our entrance and exit on Clear Spring. And when you, drivers who come from here, they're gonna be like, oh, I can't get out there, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna turn onto Clear Spring and cut through the neighborhood, or I'm gonna turn onto Widener and cut through the neighborhood. Ms. Abramovitz, uh, yes. a couple questions. First, uh, do you know why there was an SH study, SHA study done in March 2018? I do Some not know. I do not know that. Okay. Mm -mm. Um, secondly, did I hear you correctly earlier that you said you estimated about 1,800 trips would be going to? About 1,800 cars. Would be yes. going? Trips, right. To the Burger King? Yes. So that was based on the, in the traffic concept study that they provided today, there were three scatter plot charts in the back of there from the Institute for Transportation Engineers uh, uh, Trip Generation Manual. And there's a, a convergence point and it shows how many trips would be generated by a fast food drive through of a 3,333 square foot size, which is what Burger King would be, and how many points at, at different times of day. So that's where those numbers came from. Um, from York all the way to Widener, is there legal parking on Walker Avenue on the side of the street? Yes, there's legal parking here, 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 uh, up to all the, yes, all the way up to Clear Spring. Yes, so there's legal parking on both sides. Is of any of that hourly or is that 24 no, hours? No, it's just okay. anybody at any time can park there. And they, and they do, and they do. Um, it was, they do. Um, it was interesting to note that, that um, Ms. Hecker was saying that uh, there's surplus parking at the shopping center. And uh, you can see here, this is the parking lot. It's always parked up. It's always parked up. And there are cars that will park along here. This map was done, what's the date on this one? Well, it's 2019, but um, there is no surplus of parking spaces in that lot. Is this Mustang parked? Is that like where they park, where the cars park? Legal, that's legal, legally parked. Anybody can park there. That's correct. Okay. Here, and here's another picture. If you guys could bring this a little closer. Here's another picture, this is, um, this is a, a little lower for the short people. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, a 
a bus, a mobility bus that's parked there, picking someone up, I think, from the uh, apartment building here. Just beyond that is that would is the entrance exit to the shopping center. So you've talked a lot about the sight lines, and I'm intimately familiar with an intersection like this near my house that is the yeah. cause of multiple car accidents, for instance. And if you ask me to tell you how many, because it's so close to my house, I can tell you, like, in any given month, how many cars are T-boned coming out of... Are, are there accidents here? Is yes. Is what you're saying? Yes. Like, frequent accidents? Yes. Um, and down at... Um, 20 I, accidents over a six month period? Uh, that I don't know at that particular in, intersection. I know at um, here there were 20 accidents. Um, so, yes, there are. Well, I'm mostly interested about this right. intersection that's coming. Because right. One of these, the sight line argument and the your statement that you believe that everybody is from this drive through is going to exit this way, correct? Yes. And that cars par frequently are parked up and down here, which theoretically could make the sight line even worse. Correct, exactly. Okay. That's exactly what, what we're saying. That's exactly what we're saying. Um, about your time. Okay, and so I'm, I'm just about done. And so back to the parking spaces, the net loss of 54 spaces, that's a lot of spaces. I mean, they... They're taking 71 spaces out of that existing lot. They're adding 17, but that's a net loss of 54 spaces. And where are those cars going to go? They're going to go here. They're going to go here. And they're going to make that intersection more dangerous. I mean, the bottom line is there are already too many accidents and incidents along this road. Um, red light running, frustrated driving, speeding, all that stuff, all that stuff is going to be made worse the more congested this becomes. Um, and so on behalf of the Lake Walker Community Association and myself, I respectfully request that you deny the application for the drive through Thank you. Thank you. Really, really quick, and I can direct this at council. Do you have any statistics on the accidents on that road in this corridor? Nothing? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kyle Engler, and I live at 507 Walker Avenue, the corner of Walker and Clear Spring, directly across from the proposed site of new construction. I have lived in my home for 16 years with my husband, daughter, and various animals. When we purchased this 104-year-old home, we knew that there were retail stores nearby and were happy for that. We were not expecting that a drive-through traffic would eventually encroach to be a mere 80 feet from our front door. My daughter's bedroom faces Walker Avenue and has three bay windows, ample to allow light, noise, and exhaust to come directly into her room. I oppose the drive through at Burger King. In my testimony today, I would like to address three key impacts of the proposed drive through Light pollution, noise pollution, and exhaust pollution. The light pollution will come from multiple sources, the vehicles in the drive through and the building itself. The building plans show lighting around the top of the building, six-foot-tall medallions, and an 18-foot sign on a freestanding pole. The owner of the proposed Burger King states that the hours of operation will be 6 a.m. to 11 or midnight. He also states that the lights will be on for the safety of his staff two hours before and after. That means that we can expect only two to three hours of darkness appropriate for sleeping in a residential neighborhood. This is hardly the expectation as no other shops facing residential properties are lighting signs for this long in our neighborhood. Can I stop you right there Please. for a second? Um, could you speak to whether or not those lights are on because of the drive through or because of the restaurant itself? The lights are on because of the restaurant itself. They would be on regardless. Okay. And they're always shielded. Yeah, they, they are lights that are directed to go onto the property. That's required these days on okay. the building code. So However, there are, there are oh, no additional lights for the drive through. There are no additional lights for the drive through. However, the lighting. Um, yeah. 
the city code for drive through states that no exterior lighting may be used that will produce glare into or upon the surrounding area or residential neighborhoods, uh, residential premises. My house sits on a hill. This particular property is raised. The lighting, a four foot fence will do nothing to mitigate lighting into my property. Absolutely nothing. Um, yeah, please. Uh, the argument has been made for screening, but based on the elevation, uh, there is no way a fence will adequately screen my property or others on the street from lights. My house is the corner here behind this bush, but yeah. Um, the noise pollution concerns me because of the incredibly close proximity to my home and to the homes of others to this proposed building and all the traffic it will generate. The drive-through operations intercoms, the vehicles that use the drive-through uh, and will produce intolerable noise, sound of vehicle engines, sound systems, and horns honking will be a feature of daily life for nearly 18 hours a day if the drive-through is allowed. Added to this noise and sonic mix will be the near daily dumpster emptying and delivery of supplies by 18-wheeler trucks. According to both city and county codes, we are entitled to ambient noise levels that are not detrimental to life, health, or the enjoyment of private property. Sound use in commercial slash residential boundaries must not exceed 64 decibels, 61 decibels, and 58 decibels between the hours of 9 p.m. and 8, 7 a.m. They must be sev five decibels less. Um, I have a dB meter on my phone as a, I am a musician. Currently, the uh, decibel reading from my front step is between, in morning hours is between 54 decibels to 66 decibels, not including emergency vehicles. That will only increase, and we will not meet these criteria, of course, until after it's already built, and then I can stand here and say, I told you so. Exhaust. The traffic that will be generated by the drive through and the vehicles idling in it will produce large and unacceptable amounts of vehicle exhaust that will be concentrated 80 feet from my home. There will also be 18 hours of cooking exhaust odors. According to the Maryland Department of Environment, over the course of a year, one car idling for just five minutes a day can emit as many as 25 pounds of harmful air pollutants and about 260 pounds of carbon dioxide. In conclusion, this drive-through negatively impacts our community, our safety and our health and well-being. If we want to stay in this city and continue to fight for its future, we need to know that our city governance is on our side in defending these things. I thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. And the final, all right. Final uh, person is Mr. Sugarman. I've got handouts for everyone. I'm gonna distribute those. Uh, hello, my name is Joe Sugarman, and um, I am going to speak about the impact of the pr proposed drive through on pedestrians in the neighborhood. Um, my wife and I have lived with our two daughters ages 10 and 13 in the Lake Walker neighborhood for 15 years. One of the reasons my family and I moved to this neighborhood was that it was pedestrian friendly. We wanted to be able to walk to businesses and to restaurants, and we do. However, one of the major problems with this proposed drive through is that it makes an already dangerous situation for pedestrians that much worse. Uh, let me describe the current situation. In order to access the businesses and the Annesley Shopping Center where the Burger King is proposed, my kids, their friends, or any of my neighbors walk or ride their bikes north along Clear Spring or Widener Avenue out of our neighborhood before crossing Walker Avenue. And I know you have heard that this is a winding hilly residential road with poor sight lines. Uh, there is a proposed um, 25 mile an hour speed limit, but cars don't necessarily uh, obey that, and the policemen frequently set up speed traps on Walker Avenue just east of Widener because of this. The intersections at both Clear Spring and Widener are narrow with no sidewalks, so kids have to hug the curb in order to walk or bicycle here. As you can see from photo one, if you could look at that, uh, which is the view from the curb at Clear Spring Road, the proposed entry and exit point of the drive through along Walker Avenue as another dangerous element to an already tricky situation for pedestrians. If you could look at photos two, three, and four, these show the compromised lines of sight 
facing pedestrians coming out of Clear Spring Road and Widener Avenue. As you can see, this is already a difficult crossing. Uh, the increase in cars and distracted drivers fumbling with their french fries as they exit Burger King adds another layer of risk to the situation. Uh, undoubtedly, with the increase of traffic along Walker Avenue, there will be more drivers cutting through our neighborhood on both of these small side streets in order to avoid waiting at the traffic light at York and Walker to the west, uh, which already backs up during rush hours. This sets up further opportunities for pedestrian-involved accidents on these two streets which I mentioned, as you can see in the photographs, do not have sidewalks. Mr. Sugarman, yes. can you go into that very briefly in a little more detail? Because I'm very familiar with your neighborhood, and I'm trying to understand how an additional commercial use in a shopping center that is across Walker Avenue will impact Lake Walker as a residential community on the other side of Lake Walker. So can you explain how traffic either currently cuts through Clear Spring or how any commercial activity in the shopping center would increase the uh, likelihood of that? Mm -hmm. uh, in several ways. Well, first of all, as uh, Janet spoke, um, with the backup along Walker Avenue, cars will undoubtedly cut through Clear Spring and Widener. Um, they but do they, that. But they would have to know that you could cut through there, correct? Yeah, they so they that. would live in your neighborhood. They do that already now. Cars okay. cut through because um, they try to access uh, different streets um, on the other side of the neighborhood. Um, my purpose of this or my perspective is from the pedestrian uh, standpoint. Um, and I know when I have gone with my kids, we have to sort of dodge traffic that could come on to Clear Spring or Widener because there are no sidewalks there. Um, with the increase of traffic coming on through Walker, uh, I think that poses a problem. Um, and an okay. increase of uh, traffic through there. Okay. So, Thank um, you. And those two streets are the main streets going north from our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Also to the west, uh, the intersection of York Road and Walker Avenue is also an issue when it comes to the proposed drive-through. A 2015 traffic study conducted by the Maryland Department of Transportation revealed that more than 1,000 people crossed this intersection in a, in a single day. That is 1,000 people. Um, and I also want to note that um, the uh, Burger King traffic study did not um, address pedestrians, um, uh, I believe, in, that, in their traffic study. Um, their traffic study would not show the number of pedestrians crossing uh, those intersections. Um, some of those people on uh, York Road live just south of the intersection of Walker uh, at the Walker Muse, Walker Muse Apartments which offers affordable housing for seniors and peoples with disability. Most of them do not own cars, and you'll see many crossing Walker Avenue along York Road with their walkers wearing wheelchairs uh, in order to get a cup of coffee at Panera or to pick up a prescription at Walgreens. Increasing the number of cars turning onto Walker Avenue to, to access or exit the proposed Burger King drive through again makes this, makes this already dangerous situation worse. Uh, the proposed drive through also does nothing to mitigate pedestrian vehicular encounters within the shopping center parking lot itself. According to the site design, pedestrians entering from Walker Avenue do so on a sidewalk parallel to the entryway and then must cut in front of entering or exiting traffic in order to access the front doors of the restaurant. If pedestrians want to continue to any of the other shops in the plaza just to the north, they must cross the entry lanes to the drive through again. The layout effectively gives pedestrians not just one, but two chances of interaction with automobiles. Also, please consider the sidewalk along the north side of Walker Avenue itself. To access the drive through cars can enter and exit here. Pedestrians will be forced to wait or dodge cars entering or exiting this drive through driveway in order to proceed east or west onto Walker Avenue. I would argue the proposed drive through does not meet the goals as outlined on the BMZA's website to secure safety or reduce congestion while promoting the general welfare of the community. Um, as I stated at the start of this testimony, um, Lake Walker is a pedestrian friendly city neighborhood. Um, I also wanted to mention that, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe that any of Mr. Edwards' uh, Burger Kings are actually in the city in residential neighborhoods. They're all suburban locations. Um, I do admit that I still get nervous when, I, when my kids ask to cross uh, Lake uh, Walker Avenue to visit shops in Annesley's shopping center. But with a drive through adding traffic to the road and complicating an already dangerous situation, I hesitate to let my kids visit these businesses on their own. And frankly, that is a real shame. 
because it is one of the reasons we moved to this neighborhood and to this city. A drive-through, which will generate massive additional traffic by a, res by a residential neighborhood, does not belong. And most significantly, a drive-through on this particular stretch, and I think that's key, on this stretch of Walker Avenue where the sight lines already pose a hazard to pedestrians, especially, does not belong. And I respectfully ask the board to deny the applicant's request to build a drive-through in the Annis Lee Shopping Center. I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sugarman, yes. are there any crosswalks at all on Walker Avenue? No. So I think I just maybe have one or two minutes remaining of my time, um, so I will be very brief. Um, just to wrap up, Section 14.311.E1 says that all drive through lanes, oh, sorry, of the zoning code, says that all drive through lanes must be located and designed to ensure that they will not adversely affect the safety and efficiency of traffic circulation on adjoining streets. This requirement has not been met in this application according um, to the community association. The testimony from the community has been overwhelming that existing traffic is already a concern for residents and a drive through will only exacerbate those concerns. This section of the code also states that exterior lighting may not um, be used that would produce a glare onto surrounding areas or other premises, um, and it requires certain screening for the cars that will be in the drive through lane. Um, you've heard testimony today um, that that will not be sufficient according to the plan that's been pr presented um, to protect uh, nearby residents from glare and harsh lighting. However, um, in the event that the board does approve the conditional use, there are a certain set of conditions that we would ask that you uh, require. Again, these conditions do not, um, they do not provide safety uh, for the community. They are not sufficient to alleviate the concerns raised by the community, but if the board does decide to approve um, the conditional use, these are conditions that we would request. Again, just to reiterate, um, the association and the neighborhood strongly oppose the application, and we ask that you deny it um, due to its inevitable negative effect on public health, safety, and welfare. Um, and for all these reasons, we ask that you deny the application. Thank you so much. Could I ask a one thing? There was a gentleman here who spoke up previously, uh -huh. mentioning a number of accidents in a, in a location. Could I, could I hear from you, sir? Could you come to the podium for a sec? You have to introduce yourself. Do you state your name? I'm Richard Doty. I'm a resident of Lake Walker. Okay. There was a question or an issue posed previously on the sub subject of accidents which had occurred, and you seem to have a response to that 20 in the Well, minutes. the community association sent out some talking points for us when we wrote our letters, and part of that, uh, there was a citation in there about uh, the number of accidents that had occurred over the last, over a six-month period that said 20. That's that's what I was referring to. From what? source what was the source of that information <coughs> um, the baltimore city police there were 20 accidents uh, over the most recent six month period three with injuries and the location that we're talking oh, about i'm sorry well. the location was the york and Walden <coughs> intersection six months from today the last six months that's okay that's well six months from Whenever the study was. <laughs> or so ago. Okay, yeah. very well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I miss Witt. I had a quick follow-up question. Yep. Um, so drive throughs are conditional use in the zoning district. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're very well aware, um, when city council determines that a particular use is a conditional use, there's a presumption of validity for that use, right? So city council presumes that there are going to be certain harmful effects for a gas station or uh, a store or a drive-through, but they 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 call it a conditional use, and they say that it's okay in this particular zoning district. Uh, in order to disprove that, in order for this board to deny it, um, that presumption has to be overborne by evidence uh, showing that this particular use at this particular location um, is essentially no worse than any other location within that zone. Mm -hmm. Um, if you could just briefly address um, that aspect of the conditional use part of this application. Sure. So just briefly, um, I think looking at this site from an aerial perspective, um, it makes sense that the entire shopping district would be categorized 
as a commercial use. It is all one shopping district as you look at it from above. But because the traffic will, according to the testimony that community members have raised, will have to come on this winding side street, this specific area of the shopping center, um, it's not the same as if you would put a Burger King out on your road itself. It has a lot more neighborhood impact than it would if you put it out on York Road. And so that's really the difference here is that, you know, we're not saying that we don't understand this is a shopping center, but because of the way that this specific part of the shopping center has been laid out and the way that people will use to access it, has they, it must take them through essentially a residential area, that that has more negative impact than it would normally have if it were on any other part of the shopping center. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to have Mr. Keeley come back up in rebuttal and address some of the, the comments that were made on the, the traffic study because I don't think they were properly um, <coughs> made to the board. So, um, right. uh, just, why don't I just turn it over to you? So, okay. Mark Keeley, Traffic Concepts. Um, first of all, the Burger King's a pad site within the shopping center, so it becomes part of the shopping center. We're not creating new access points. We're going to utilize the existing access points to York Road and Walker Avenue. So in terms of site distance, um, I don't know that anyone on the opposition has surveyed it, but it's an existing commercial access point um, approved by the city when the shopping center was constructed and approved at a location that I'm, I'm assuming that was deliberately chosen. Um, in terms of the traffic, I think the figure three, the weekday peak hour traffic on Walkersville, I think that includes 100% of the peak hour trips um, determined by the ITE, which is, you know, again, um, this is a pass by convenience type use. So 50% are going to make a right from York Road and make a right out. I mean, traffic is like water. It's going to find the easiest path. So if indeed there is a queue on Walkersville during the peak hour at the signal, then you're going to go through the shopping center and make a right out, a free right. Um, you're going to wait for a gap. It's not free, but you're going to wait for a gap in traffic and make a right instead of at the traffic signal where you might have to wait in a queue to turn right. Um, so I think it's disingenuous to say that all the traffic is going to impact um, Walker Avenue. Um, again, the pass-by trips are important. Those are trips that are already on the roadway. So they're not new trips coming to the site. There's trips already on the roadway. They're already on Walker Avenue. They're already on um, York Road. They're going to turn from their, their main destination into the site. In terms of pedestrians, um, it, it is a dense residential commercial. It's a mixed area. The Baltimore County has an office there. We, we would expect that some of the trips to our site are not going to be vehicle trips. Um, it's a wor the study is the worst case. We, we're saying all the trips here are uh, passenger car trips. Um, but during the uh, noontime hour, some of those trips are going to be pedestrian trips. They're going to be people walking from the offices nearby, they're going to be shared trips with retail and they're going to walk over to the Burger King. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, some portion of those trips are going to be pedestrian. We don't include them in the study because we're showing a worst case traffic by including uh, passenger car trips. So, um, I, I take exception to some of the um, the data, especially figure three, I think it's it's overemphasizes the traffic. Um, Wait a minute, figure three on what? Oh, and the opposition exhibit um, provided to us. Okay, just here. Yeah, so I think that, and from my read of this, it's you're taking the ITE peak hour traffic and just <coughs> laying it on top of. I, I'm not sure what the blue is, if that's peak hour or if that's daily traffic. I'm not sure what that is. Those were, those were the traffic at that, those hours. 
Okay, so these represent. But still, I, th I think you're taking all of the traffic generated by IT and, and assigning that traffic to Walker Avenue, which is not going to be the case. <coughs> So the 1,800 trips a day, that was determined by adding up the peak hour trips um, from each time period, I think, which um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not understanding how we got to 1,800 trips. Um, did your study have a... We didn't do an average, we didn't do a daily trip generation. We just did, these are peak hour trips. Is that part of a, uh, is that a standard part of a traffic study? Um, sometimes that data is given, but we analyze the peak hour. So it's the peak hour trips that are important to us. Um, this, and I think it was, somebody mentioned 200 trips. The ITE, the, the midday peak hour, I think was 172, but again, half of those trips, so 80, 86 of those trips are gonna be passed by and 86 are gonna be new or diverted trips. Um, so all of them are gonna access the shopping center access points, but they're not, they're not new trips added to the road. I just wanna emphasize that point. Yeah, I have two points for you of testimony that I heard. The 1,800 cars through my drive-through, um, there is no possible way for that. My best stores do 400 cars a day. Um, 1,800 is more than I get in a couple of couple of three four days. Um, and to the point on uh, Janet's uh, statement about what I said concerning. Um, my willingness to build the store um, without a drive-through. Um, with every answer to a question, you have to understand the context of the question. Um, and that was during their community meeting when uh, I was said, if we prevent you, well, the group said, if we prevent you from building your drive-through, will you go away? Um, <laughs> and the answer, the answer, the answer to that, I mean, it, it's not verbatim, but that was the context of the message. And I said that uh, Burger King does allow drive-throughs um, or Burger King stores uh, without drive-throughs, but they have to approve it. I've discussed it to, with them, and they, are, they would consider it. But just like I said earlier, uh, same with me. I'd have to consider it, but it would do... Um, great damage to the business without the drive through All right, well, I'll wrap up briefly. I know we've been here a long time. Um, I do want to mention that a, a, several of the concerns we heard in, in the opposition are things that would occur regardless of the drive through the issue about the light um, screening from the, um, the building itself. I mean, that the building itself is going to be lit regardless of whether there's a drive through there's going to be deliveries, their dumpsters are going to be emptied. The sounds that one would hear from that are not at all related to the drive-through. Um, the site also, I'd like to remind the board, has been reviewed and approved uh, by the site plan review committee, as Mr. French indicated in his um, report. The city agencies that are responsible for reviewing building permits have all looked at this site. DOT has looked at it. Um, they have all commented. We've revised plans in accordance with their comments. They have determined that the functionality of the drive-through as proposed on the site plan is both safe and, and appropriate for this, this particular site. So, you know, to the extent that there is um, layperson testimony that they don't think it's a good layout, the city experts have reviewed it and they have signed off on it. Um, the, the legal standard for approving a conditional use, um, and again, this is a C3 zoning district, with, which is a shopping center designation, is that the uh, inherent adverse effects of the use are, some, are no worse at this location than they otherwise generally would be. You know, the city council, as Mr. Bumgarner said, the city council has determined that there are, you know, they, they understand that there are inherent adverse effects associated with certain uses, but those uses are presumptively allowed 
absent some showing that they're, they're somehow significantly worse at a particular location. And, and we don't have that here. If you think about the place where you would want to see a drive through restaurant, you would want to see a drive through restaurant at a pad site in an existing shopping center located along a major commercial thoroughfare. And that's what we have here. This is exactly where a drive through belongs. It's, it's already impervious surface. We're not digging up any, any green space. Uh, there's already existing traffic on the road. Um, and it, we have done everything that we can to mitigate the, um, the quote unquote adverse effects in terms of noise and light. And um, you know, we're not asking for any variances relating to setbacks or parking or signage or anything to that end. So you know, this really is limited to the use of the property for the drive through. Um, and I think that we have more than met the burden of showing that the inherent adverse effects of the use would not be worse at this location than they otherwise could be expected to be. Um, I, I will also like to comment briefly the conditions that Ms. Witt provided us. This is the first time we're seeing them. I sort of wish we had had the opportunity to look at these earlier because I think generally these are pretty workable with a few tweaks and I, you know, I, I would not want to suggest that the board just attach them as is. but. Um, I mean, if it's, if it's worth having a conversation about these conditions, I'm happy to sort of walk through what, um, you know, sort of where we are on these things. Um, and again, I wish I'd, I'd had the opportunity to see these earlier. Um, um, I don't know. Why don't you give me that? Okay. <laughs> Since we're here. Since we're here, right? Um, you know, with regard to the hours of operation, they have requested that they end no later than 10 p.m. each day. We can live with 11 o'clock, which is a reduction from midnight when we were planning to be open to midnight. Um, you know, if, if the board were to condition the approval on a end, uh, 11 p.m. closing time, that's something we can live with. Um, the, the second one is that the establishment shall build and maintain a fence and or hedge and landscaping along the length of the existing stone wall in order to shield nearby residents from glare resulting from the building or cars in the drive through Further, it shall restore the capstones on the existing wall. We can, we can do that. I mean, that's, you know, we, we're doing significant landscaping to begin with. You know, that's something that we certainly can do. Um, the third condition they've requested is that the establishment shall install crosswalks, sidewalks, and other pedestrian-oriented safety measures on site and around the entrance on Walker Avenue. Um, I think we would want to um, understand exactly what the extent of that would be, and we would want to see the city's traffic calming study to know what the city's requesting. You can't just do that. The city has but, to approve Correct. It. But we, you know, we, we certainly would be happy to cooperate with the city in terms of installation of crosswalk side, you know, something to make things a little more accessible from a pedestrian perspective. We think they're good the way they are. Again, the site plan review committee has signed off on it the way it is, but um, to the extent that we can assist the city in doing that type of work, I think, you know, we would, we were happy to work with them on that. Um, the, num the number four condition, the establishment shall reconfigure its Walker Avenue entrance to be one way with no automobile exit onto Walker Avenue. We don't control that. That's controlled by the shopping center owner. Um, so we, that's just out of our control. Um, the fifth condition is that the establishment shall install and maintain industrial odor scrubbers. If we, we will do that if we need that to comply with the regulations governing exhaust fumes. I mean, we'll comply with whatever the regulations are. If, if we need to have scrubbers to maintain the appropriate standards, then of course we'll do that. Um, and then finally, the last condition is that the establishment shall not install freestanding or attached permanent or temporary signage or posters on or visible from the Walker Avenue side of its premises or lot. I think we would agree to not install any signs that are not allowed by code, but we'll, you know, we would like to be able to be in, able to install whatever signage the zoning code would permit. Um, and again, we're not seeking variances here. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, I wish we had had these earlier because there may have been a middle ground that we could have worked out, but I, you know, these are generally pretty workable conditions for us. And if that's a way to give everyone sort of the, the, the best possible result, then, you know, as I said, we can, we can work with most of these. Um, Thank you for offering that up. Uh, so with that, I think, I think we'll wrap things up unless you, you have any further questions for us. Questions? No. Thank you all for your presentation. Thank really you appreciate all. Appreciate it. Very helpful. That's it. That's it. All right. I really have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Did you have fun today? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much you liked it. Um, I'm unfinished. Yeah, I just had, like, <laughs> Actually, I had a <laughs> 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 You
need okay, some. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a water cooler in that room back there. If you yeah. need water. I'm good. I just need a tissue. Oh my God. I'm okay. <laughs> Okay. I don't have to call <laughs> <at> all. <laughs>